Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Introduction to Learning Centers, and it is part of God's Way of Love series. It was presented in Philadelphia, USA on the 22nd of July, 2012. Just do the point at a time, so the first point. Yeah. yeah, what do you want to call it though? God's Way of Love Learning Centres? Yeah, I'm calling it God's Way of Love uh, Introduction to Learning Centres. So we'll call it that. You're definitely better at this. Now the reason why we've called it God's Way of Love is that's the organisation that we've named uh, an organisation in Australia called God's Way of Love. It's an organisation that... Um, basically runs by a constitution that is downloadable on the internet. The website is www.godswayoflove, all one word, dot org. It's an um, organisation that's run as a normal company in Australia, but we run it as a non-profit, even though it doesn't have non-profit status. And the reason why it doesn't have non-profit status is because they wanted us to change the constitution to suit the non-profit regulations in Australia and the changes they wanted me to make to the constitution I couldn't make to the constitution without diluting the, uh, the organisation constitution itself. So, so we ch just chose not to change it. Not on. Okay. You're on, aren't you, Jean? Is our, oh, um, Michael's not, not here. here. He didn't get in the photo either. No, we missed Michael in the photo. Okay, so the subject of this discussion is God's Way of Love, so referring to the God's Way of Love organisation that we've begun in Australia, but which we would like to see um, all over the world eventually. And this discussion is about an introduction to learning centres. And the reason why we wanted to have this discussion is because quite a number of you um, indicated to us that you would like to know what a learning centre would do or would be and would like to know the underlying principles of running a learning centre and what needs to be organised to run a learning centre and so forth. So what we would like to do is go through with you some of the underlying principles of what would govern a learning centre if there was a learning centre to be sent up, set up in the North American continent. At the moment, we have uh, two learning centres completely uh, in the process uh, uh, set up, actually, in Australia. And there's a third one, which is currently being set up. Another uh, one in Australia is currently being investigated to be set up. And we expect that that third one will be up and running within a month or so. There is also a learning centre in Sweden that's currently that's just been um, purchased by a couple. And uh, they are in the process of setting up the centre. Um, and the learning centres themselves are not owned by the God's Way of Love organisation. They are owned by individuals who have a strong desire to have a learning centre for the principles of demonstrating the principles of divine truth on the planet. So this is why we'd like to go through the, the underlying principles that will govern the operation of a learning centre. And... Um, what happens with the learning centres, if I can I illustrate it first, is that myself and Mary and also some others from Australia go around to each centre and actually help the centre to demonstrate the principles that we're going to outline to you here. And what we do is we basically are in an advisory role only with regard to the centre. So please understand that these centres are not always perfectly operating to the principles that we would actually operate to, Mary and myself. We only provide advice to people who own the centres. We do not enforce that advice and there is in fact no mechanism that we, can, we have created to enforce any advice given to any person who would actually decide to run a learning centre. The reason why we have done that, or the reasons why we've done that, are quite a lot of reasons. And uh, the primary ones are that we do not wish to control the will 
of any single person who decides they would like to set up some kind of a centre. However, we do want to give them as much assistance as we can to bring the centre into harmony with the way God loves. So, so that is our underlying goal. So our primary goal with these centres is not to own any land. Myself and Mary have no ownership of any land other than our own property that I bought before myself and Mary met. We don't wish to own, also control any learning centre in the sense that we do not wish to have a day-to-day -day operational impact upon these learning centres because our desire is to do what we're doing now which is to share divine truth to the world the whole world and obviously part of the mechanism of doing that will be in future the learning centers we feel however it's not the only mechanism that we will be using to help the divine truth come to the planet however these learning centres are going to be, we feel, a very good way of illustrating the principles of divine truth to, to people and a great way of illustrating those principles of divine truth when it's put into action, when, when actually your soul changes and, and seeing the results of your soul changing. And so for that reason, the people who are the owners of the centres, we will engage when we feel there is a very strong desire on their part to put into action the principles that we're teaching. So in other words, myself and Mary will only continue to provide advice to a centre while we feel the owners of the centre are actually applying the advice and living a life in harmony with the principles of divine truth and divine love. Does that make sense? So, so while we do not control the centre and we do not have any day-to-day -day, um, impact upon its operation, we, we are very concerned that these centres actually live in harmony with what they purport to live in harmony with. And if they do not, then we will no longer provide advice. Or, or assistance to those centres. Which is actually okay with us. We don't feel yeah. invested in having a certain number of centres or having a certain outcome. Mm. We just feel we'd love to work with people who would like to demonstrate these ideals to people on earth and we'll do that for as long as they want to do that. And, and if, if they no longer want to do it, then we'll stop. That's <laughs> Basically, fine. that's yeah. how it works. But some people think they want to do it when they don't and, and under those circumstances, we'll also stop. Does that make sense to everyone? Because there are times when people think they're doing, you know, what, a loving thing when obviously they might be doing an unloving thing based on their addictions or unhealed fears. And, and what we do is we spend a lot of time with them uh, working, helping them work through those particular issues. If What we've found is that it's a very fluid process. Uh, so, so we don't expect people to change overnight. So we don't expect something to be exposed today and then the, then the people in the centre deal with it tomorrow and then if they don't deal with it tomorrow then we never see them again. That's not how it works. What we do is we interact with them while they have the desire to interact with us and we interact with them while they have the desire to, to actually develop the centre in harmony with love. And, and sometimes that desire initially is quite you know, skewed, <laughs> out of harmony with love and we've had to you know, give advice and, and so forth of people. Now, for, if I can give you some examples of that. There's one centre in Australia that um, used to be a sheep and cattle station. And, and they still do run sheep, um, for not for meat production, but for wool production. Um, but they had all of these cattle as well. And so one of the pieces of advice that we gave to them is that... Is that to bring the centre into harmony with love, that these cattle would have to go. Like when I say go, that they that have to either be living there without ever being sold to a slaughterhouse or or, or, or something like that, or they'd have to be sold to a, a, a person who's willing to look after the cattle, in, you know, in a manner that's a bit better than having them go down to a slaughter to be slaughtered. And and so in the end, the guys there decided that. And it took them quite a few months to decide what to do about that because we're talking about 1,200 head of cattle. So you're talking about you know, uh, over a million dollars worth of cattle. Um, 
that they needed to decide what to do with just from one recommendation that we made and and it took them around six or seven months to decide what to do with those with those cattle and to bring the system the the their set up into more harmony with love does that make sense and and we still worked with them during that time and we didn't hold that over their head and tell them that we couldn't work with them while they weren't dealing with that issue we just allowed them to go through the process emotionally of what what that entailed and uh and they did that and eventually those cattle were sold to another owner who cares for them now um, and they no longer have cattle on the property at all. In addition, they, had, uh, they have a very large uh, amount of sheep. They, it was a 15,000 acre property, um, this property. So they have a, a large number of sheep as well, 20,000 head of sheep. And, um, and they had to bring some of their operations into more harmony with love with those sheep as well. So then they've had to work their way through those issues emotionally. And in doing that, they realised that they probably couldn't care for these sheep, as many of these sheep, in a loving way. And so they've actually decided to sell some of their sheep as well. And these are very big financial decisions they've had to make, as you can imagine. And so, you know, quite often the decisions that uh, we, we encourage people to make or, or advise them to make can be quite confronting. That being said, they don't have to make them. They don't have to make those decisions. It's up to them what they do. They are the owners of the property. So that's the, that's the thing to bear in mind. So what we'd like to do now is go through with you, now that we've explained a little bit of the background of how we interact with the, the learning centres. Myself and Mary f finish up spending quite a bit of time at the learning centres in Australia. In fact, uh, they are the locations that we visit the most frequently. And in fact, uh, when we go to other countries too, like when we just had a visit recently to Sweden, we only spent two days doing seminars and the rest of the time we were there, which is another se uh, seven. seven or eight days, we spent at the learning centre with the people who are running the centre. And that's our normal focus uh, now. We, we try to spend as much time as we can helping the people who want to run the centre to become more loving in their own manner in dealing with things and uh, and then what happens is those people then finish up having a good influence upon other people being more loving as well with the way that they do with things and they finish up attracting quite some amazing events actually which uh, we, we can describe some of them as we go through this discussion um, so let's uh, firstly outline the principles of the, learn of the, of the God's Way of Love organisation and the Learning Centre. This is a document, this is, all this material today is coming from a document that we've produced. It's a two-page document uh, which you can download on the internet after tomorrow because I won't have it up until <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow sometime. Um, and uh, the document is just, a, you won't need to write these things down because it's all on the document in terms of so the key is to just feel about what we're saying rather than trying to write it all down or, or whatever as we go and feel free to ask questions and feel free to ask questions about these principles so the first one we'd like to discuss with you is to demonstrate the prin so the purpose of uh, god's way of love organization is to demonstrate divine love divine truth god's laws and humility in action and in practical applications based upon the following principles. So what, what we're trying to achieve is, to, is we want to stop talking about like the principles of divine truth, if you like, and divine love, and, and actually demonstrate it in action rather than just talking about it. Does that make sense? And we want to demonstrate God's laws in action and the effects of humility in action. And the, the reason why we want to do that is because there are a lot of sayings that I, that I stated in the first century that we feel are very important for people to understand their practical applications. And so without having some kind of you know, tangible space where people can go and see what's happening, it's very, very hard for them to measure whether they themselves should embrace the process of, uh, you know, of understanding divine truth and, and, and receiving divine love from God. So these are the principles. Some of them you will probably recognise, particularly if you've had some kind of Christian religious background. The first principle we would like to illustrate is that if you seek first God's love, all other things will be added to you. So that's the first principle we'd like to illustrate through the God's Way of Love organisation. The second one 
is if you seek God's truth, it will set you free. And you've heard these sayings. The third one is, do unto others what you would like them to do to you, which is a principle of, some of you would have heard it as the golden rule, if you like. That I actually call ethics. That's the principle of ethics. And this one is, the humble or the meek will inherit the earth, which is, an, which is to do with our attitude, the attitude that we have inside of us. So these are the guiding principles of what will eventually guide the learning centres themselves. And what would happen on and the And what would actually happen on the learning centre as well. So we would like every one of these things to guide the principles. So for example, let's look at how that would happen in practice. If the meek or humble should inherit the earth, then what we would like is that every single person who comes to a learning centre is open to change, is open to being confronted emotionally and changing. To do that, they're going to have to be ready to receive feedback about any unloving behaviour that they have. Does that make sense? And, and if they become resistive to the unloving like to, their, to becoming aware of their own unloving behaviour, then they're no longer being humble. And so under those circumstances, they would no longer be welcome at the centre. Does that make sense? And so there has to be a way uh, of, of us... We have to ask them to leave if they're not going to be humble. If they're going to be angry all the time, we'd have to ask them to leave because that's indicating that they're not being humble. Now, we'd also welcome them back if they dealt with the issue that made them angry. So they'd be welcome to come back under the same principle. Does that make sense? With regard to this one here, um, do unto others what you would like them to do to you. So again, this applies to if somebody's angry all the time with other people at the centre then obviously they wouldn't like it if everybody was angry with them all the time. So that would be addressed with the person. And if the person is, uh, the person is not um, yielding to, to that counsel, then we'd have to ask them to leave. And then if at some point in the future they decided they would love to try and practice the same principle again, then they'd be welcome to come back. The centres are not a place where we're going to have uh, lots of people living. In other words, they're not going to be a, uh, what you would classify as some kind of commune or, or, or centre where people come to establish a home. The owners would probably live on the centre. There will be some helpers living on the centre eventually, we believe. But... The average persons, we believe, if they wanted to live near the centre, they would have to purchase their own property and live near the centre. Because we want the centre to be a location on earth that demonstrates these ideals and not just a location where people can come and live and, and live in a safe community or something like that. So, and remember that the centre is demonstrating these principles to the world not just a centre where a little commune of people get together and do their own thing and the world looks upon it and goes, well, that's a bit strange. That's not what we see the centre as being. We see the centre as being like a, like a university, but a, but, but a university focusing on the teachings of divine truth. Right? And not only focusing on those teachings, but also... Um, showing or demonstrating those teachings in a practical way to people who come and visit it. So we do see people staying temporarily on the centre. They might stay there for, you know, people might come there, integrate with the centre, but we also see that a lot of the people will probably come and live near the centre, the ones who are initially interested in it, and then spend time on the centre learning things that they then put into practice in their own properties. And this is what's happening in Australia. We have in, in the first learning centre in Australia, which is in Queensland, there is a 600-acre property, which has now become the centre of a very large community of people who, um, who are all practising divine truth principles. So there's about 40 families that have purchased property near the centre. Right? And those families now you know, visit the centre, they do different things with the teams, and a lot of the teams are not actually running on the centre. They, they actually run in the community. 
So there's teams that, that go to the community and give gifts of love to the community, for example. And that's all a part of the centre and what the centre will be doing. But these people are not spending all their time doing things to the centre. They're actually doing it to the wider community. So a lot of the principles that we're just demonstrating on the centre actually is, are the principles we want to demonstrate to the wider community. The only way we feel that divine truth can grow on the planet is firstly for there to get a group of people who have a passion to connect to God and to bring their lives into more harmony with love and to do that in a practical way. And then secondly, for that group of people to share these truths with another group of people who, who are yet to learn them. And the only way for that to occur is for, for us to be in the community and not, not separate from it. Yes. So what we found initially was that in Australia there was this initial response where we bought some land and there was a lot of things to sort out with the addictions of the owners and once all of that was sorted out then we ended up with being able to do some things with that land and once we started doing things with the land and also with the teams associated with that particular area and we'll talk about what teams are in a minute and um, once we started doing all of those things then people come become attracted to it all you know from all over the place and, and many people in Australia have come from like 3,000 kilometres away to the location. And, and they begin getting involved in the different events and things that are happening with the particular teams associated with the centre. And it, it's really a wonderful uh, process, actually. And I think a couple of you, like I think Robin has uh, been to Australia, Ellen has been to Australia recently, and you've both sort of seen two of those centres and what we've been doing in those centres. And y you can see that, that when we talk with the owners of those centres, that we, we put all of the decisions basically in their hands, but we also advise them what to do under certain circumstances and situations because you know, oftentimes we need some advice in love to, to be able to do different things. So these are the four core principles by which the centre will operate. Those four core principles. Every, we, we would love everyone who's a, a visitor to the centre to, to look at this aspect of seeking love. And if they're not seeking God's love, we're not that fussy. As long as they're seeking some to love, to love sometimes, you know, that's, that's the main thing. We want to engage them in that process. So we're very happy for an atheist to visit the centre and engage a process that, that he likes to engage as long as he's still being loving to everyone on the centre. So it's non-denominational and, and not restrictive to people who are just believers in God either. So it's pretty much anyone we'd love to see on the centre. But we want to illustrate this principle that if you do seek God first, that everything else gets added to you. That's a principle that we'd like to teach as a main principle that we, we want to demonstrate by having the centre. Another one that we want to teach is this, that God's truth will set you free. We, we want to illustrate the freedom that comes by actually absorbing truth, God's truth into your life. And, and the freedom that comes from law, how, how you don't worry about law so much. And when I say don't worry about it, I don't mean that you don't follow the law of the country. What I mean is that you're not rebellious against it. You're not trying to rebel all the time against law. Because the reality is once you feel God's truth, you don't feel any burden to follow any law that man creates because you don't have any emotional impediments to doing so. Right? But, so there's true freedom in the soul is what we want to illustrate. We also want to illustrate these two very important principles of, the, of ethics. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. A very, very important principle of ethics that we'd like to see operate all the time on the centres. And then, of course, this, this idea that humility is the key part of having these centres operate in harmony with love. People who come to the centres need to be ready to be humble, ready to listen, ready to learn. And uh, what we found initially, that we attracted a lot of people who felt they were good teachers, and in the end they ended up working out that they needed to be good learners first before they could ever become a good teacher. Then uh, what we do with that is that the God's Way of Love organisation is creating locations on the earth, all around the earth is our goal, where that are learning centres which demonstrate the, these ideals 
in a number of different ways. Firstly, they demonstrate these ideals in day-to-day -day life. They demonstrate these ideals and how they affect the environment we live in. And they demonstrate these ideals and how they affect our relationships with peoples and groups and other elements of the environment. So in other words, we want to see the relationship between the soul, its growth, and what happens in the environment. We want to see the relationship between the soul and its growth and what happens in other relationships, with partner relationships or children relationships. We want to see the soul grow and the effect it has on the person's day-to-day -day life, how they embrace desires and passions. That's why we, we want to make these centres, so that, so that they're able to demonstrate these principles. And we also want to inspire and motivate people to discover these ideals, to desire to live in them, and to passionately give the gift of the same ideals to others. Right? So we don't want to get stuck just thinking, oh, all of us are doing pretty good with these ideals, and then in the end uh, become quite self-righteous. But rather we want to get to the point where we not only discover the ideals ourselves and desire to live in them ourselves, but we also have a strong desire that we want to share the same ideals with, with everyone else in practice. Where we want to do things that demonstrate we feel these feelings. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, are there any questions so far about that? So that's the underlying purpose of the learning centres themselves. Yeah. It's pretty plain. Yeah. Okay, if we just uh, get the microphones. Um, just leave your hand up so that we can... Thank you. Um, I was just curious on um, the uh, initial uh, purchase of the land <coughs> Excuse me, and, and the learning centre... Um, you said in this particular farm it was from a, a two people or a couple uh, investing in the land. And um, how does that work with the uh, future of the uh, uh, growth of that property and the buildings and services that they would be able to provide on a financial basis? Would you uh, be like a donation kind of operation or would you um, have a certain corporate kind of structure no once the remember these are not owned by us so they're not owned by the god's way of love organization the god's way of love organization receives donations and then gives away things that's what we do so everything that we receive we finish up giving away again now sometimes we give it away to the learning center other times we give it away to other people in the community it just depends on what the directors and and the members of the organization decide is the best way to demonstrate love so, so the centres themselves can, will have to be independently, financially sufficient. For that to occur, the owners are going to have to work through all of their money issues. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the big things that most owners find very difficult right at the beginning. It, it took nearly four years for the first centre for the owners to, to work through the money issues. Many of the owners did not work through their money issues and they sold out and then another owner came in and started working through their money issues. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. And eventually yeah. we had the part, part where the, 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 the people handed it over to one family or one couple. We prefer to see it as a couple rather than just one individual. And we prefer there to be couples, you know, male and female or male and male, but couples... Uh, the reason why it's a bit more rounded, uh, you know, where they both have the same desire. But it doesn't have to be that way. But what happens is that one of the first things that the people who are the owners have to deal with is the money issue. Yeah. Because we don't want to create things on the centre that are out of harmony with love, which also means creating buildings that are out of harmony with love. And so in, in the first centre, we didn't actually... Um, we, we recommended initially not to put any buildings on it at all, initially. And, uh, and uh, right now, one of the first centre is actually building a, a residence for the, the managers of the centre, who are the owners of the centre. The owners of the centre will always be the managers of the centre. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, they will have to address their money issues, and also, once they address uh, their giving issues, they will find that they will start receiving funds, donated funds, coming to them. And those funds come from all sorts of different sources. In Australia already, funds come from the government or other people. There's different projects that we create that sometimes the government wants to support and so forth. So 
There's all sorts of sources of, of, of money coming into the centre. But it does depend a lot upon the donations of the individuals in the particular country and uh, as to what will be created on the centre. When the owners are very, very passionate about the centre and, and it becomes like their real strong passion and on top of that they work through their money issues, they start attracting funds, just like myself have ha my and Mary have had to do in, in order to live our life. And so what we're actually doing is asking the owners to engage the exact same principles that Mary and myself engage in our personal life. So there is no organisation supporting us. Um, the support comes from individuals and that support comes from individuals wanting or, or feeling appreciative of the things that we do for them. And we don't demand anything from individuals and so the centres cannot demand anything from individuals. Now, what we, how we run the God's Way of Love organisation is that if we do not have enough money to do something, we just don't do it. It's quite simple. Yeah. And we encourage the uh, centres to do exactly the same. So if they don't have enough money to do something, then don't do it. And, and a lot of times it's not money anyway that's needed to do something. So what we're finding in a lot of the centres is because it's sort of like a gathering point, we've had one centre, the centre that's down south had has already had a planting tree planting session. We had 100 people from, come from different places in Australia, camped for one week, and we finished up planting around five to 6,000 trees in that one week in a loving way. And, uh, and we had fun times every night. We uh, you know, had concert every night and mediumship and all sorts of things happened every night. And it was really great fun. And, uh, and we have those kind of events quite regularly. We also, uh, the centres... The teams associated with the centres create a lot of different things. At the moment, in, and we'll talk about the teams in a minute, but at the moment, the teams in the Queensland, associated with the Queensland Centre, there's 13 teams and there's about 50 or 60 people in each team. And they all do different things. Uh, so there's an arts team, there's a mediumship team, there's a construction team, there's a... Um, well, there's 13 of them, environment, plan, plan, team. environment team and so forth. Community team. And all of these different teams meet every week um, and they all have different jobs that they're doing and different things they're creating. And, and each one of these teams has a leader and an assistant who also practice the same principles. They have to be people focused on these principles. And what we do is if there is no way to create a team, then we don't create it. If there's not a leader yet who's shown themselves as a person who's willing to practice these principles then we don't have that team. So in other places in Australia where we've got a learning centre, there's only three teams established because there's yet no leaders come up for the other teams. Yeah. So everything is like very fluid and you've got to be quite patient if you're one of these learning, team, uh, learning centre managers or owners. You've got to be quite patient with the process because you do have to deal with your own emotions as you're going through the process for things to actually change. We, m myself and Mary, visit them and, and of course we, we advise them of what is going on in their life but, but we don't control whether they deal with those issues. So it's up to them how fast they deal with those issues and what kind of issues they address. We actually love it that way because it means that their passion and desire has to be involved in the process. And so it's sort of like a, we're all works in progress and so the learning centres become like a work in progress as well. And, and the beauty of having it associated with some land is that you start seeing changes in the environment with the animals, the birds, the plants and everything as the learning centre team manages soul changes. You start actually seeing those changes reflected in the environment and reflected into what they attract. And so it's very, very powerful, in t for the, particularly for the owners initially, um, a very powerful experience. So once the centres are created with those particular um, goals and guidelines, then what we finish up do, doing is creating projects and programs that support the development of those goals and guidelines. Right? And we call them learning centre projects or learning projects. And we call these uh, projects, we actually design these projects, and some of the projects are very simple. And some of the projects are much more difficult. So, for example, one of the projects in the, part in the last year in one of the centres was this big, we called it Oktoberfest, which was this big project where 100 people came and we planted trees for five days and 
there were a lot of things to organise, as you could imagine, for, for such a project. And the learning team managers and, and myself and Mary, we helped them through that process of organising all of those things in a loving way. These learning projects can be also quite simple. So for some of the teams that we have involved, we've actually created projects where they just have to go out in the community for one hour a week and pick up papers. And that's the project. And what we find that does is trigger quite a lot of them into, well, our project's not that important, what's <laughs> going on? And there's all these other issues that come up. And then we can address these particular emotions. The main goal of the... Well, there's, there's two main goals of the learning projects. The first goal is to, is to practically embrace the principles of, of God's way of love. So those very first four points that we listed, the learning projects are designed to help a person address one of those areas. Secondly, the learning project also will have some kind of practical application. In other words, it will have some long-term practical benefit. And eventually what we do is we focus the practical benefit on the causal problem rather than the effect. So what we're trying to do is focus the projects into dealing with co the causes of problems on the planet rather than just dealing with the effects of problems on the planet. Of course, the projects embrace both principles of causes and effects. Now, any government, institution, organisation or individual who wishes to volunteer support to the ideals, we accept their help. So, it could mean anybody. It could mean people who are from other organisations, other religious organisations, other non-profit organisations, the government... Okay. All sorts University. of... Anybody in the community. Yeah? And they're allowed to share in the projects as long as they maintain the ideals. So in other words, as long as they're humble, looking for truth, as long as they treat each other the way they'd like to be treated, they're able to be involved in the project. Who manages that kind of the ethics? Um, the Learning Centre managers are responsible for all of this. They are responsible to enforce the ethics, even. Is there a specific committee that's... or No, no committee. Okay. There are no committees in any of these learning centres. The reason why is committees is a great way to reduce the amount of love that's happening in any organisation because <laughs> the, the person who... Most people laughing have been on committees. <laughs> the person in the least amount of love in the committee is usually what f who finishes up guiding the committee. We're choosing the learning centre, well, the learning centre managers are choosing themselves by having the desire and then we work with those centre managers to help them become more loving and, and pur purified in their love. And, and then the responsibility lays upon them that they then make sure that their particular um, property is brought into harmony with love. And, it, and the responsibility is totally theirs. So anything that is out of harmony with love on the property needs to be addressed by those managers. Yep. Thank you. And, uh, and if the, it isn't addressed by those managers, myself and Mary talk to them. We talk to them about it. Why isn't it being addressed? What's going on for you? And then if they, um, if they need some assistance in knowing what to do, then we give them some advice and so forth. But if they said, look, um, we don't want to do it, as simple as that, and then we'd say, well, we can't give you advice anymore, as simple as that. And we just move on to whoever wants to, to receive the advice given. So from our perspective, there's no control, with the exception that if we are going to engage working with the centre managers, we do expect the centre managers to wish to engage the same principles that we're engaging. Yep. Thank you. But that is a growing process, of course. So you know, we, we don't expect that to happen overnight, like I said. It's impossible to happen overnight, and we don't expect the, the impossible. So, um, sorry, babe, am I? That's okay. No, keep yeah. going. Um, so, can you see too that from this second point here, if you can just bob down a bit, babe, participation. <laughs> sorry, you don't have it's to okay. keep writing. <laughs> it's all right. Participation can form contribution of resources, knowledge, effort, finances. So, so it can be in any of these areas of resources. They can participate by giving resources, by giving us some knowledge. By, by providing some effort, you know, physical effort, finances, as long as the contributions are gifted. So in other words, 
we don't accept loans or quid pro quo arrangements. You do this for me and I'll do this for you. Does that make sense? We only accept gifts. And by the way, we only give gifts. We don't enter into arrangements either. We only give gifts as well to others. So the purpose of the centre is to give gifts to the community, not for it primarily to receive gifts from the community. The whole purpose of the centre is to focus on giving gifts to others, giving the gift in particular of truth and love to others, but, but doing it in a practical way. So these projects are, are created by the Learning Centre managers and we often, myself and Mary, often give them a lot of uh, advice about you know, what kind of projects we feel they could create and uh, they of course make a choice of different projects that they'd like to do and, uh, and then often what happens based on their own dealing with their different emotions, they attract volunteers and funds to perform the particular project and then we go ahead with the project as long as all of the contributions have been gifted to the project. And the project doesn't necessarily mean it will be on the centre. It may even be in the community. So we have many projects in Australia that are not on the centre and that are in the community. Right? So we had a project uh, oh, around about a year ago now where the arts team and the hospitality team did a weekend of, uh, of creating a concert. Right? And, and what we did was we had a whole series of auditions on the Saturday where people had to come and uh, you know, audition what they were going to deliver on the concert. Then we gave them feedback, which was emotional, not feedback about other things, but we focused on emotional feedback. And the people who we felt were in the best condition and also who, who gave of themselves the best, you know, gave of themselves as a gift rather than demanding some kind of attention or approval, we allowed them to be on the concert. And on the Sunday afternoon, we had a concert for the public. And it was a great concert. We had so much fun. There were about 30, 20 or 30 people who ended up being on the concert. And it was a very good quality concert. Right? People were dancing and it was, it was very good. And we had good vegan food. And we had good vegan food from the hospitality team. But we didn't tell anybody who came from the public that it was vegan food. Huh? So we didn't preach to them or anything else. Like it was just given to them as a gift. And a lot of them commented about, wow, wow this is amazing food. You? You know, and, then, and then in the conversation they got to hear that it was actually no animal products in any of the food. So it was a very interesting concert, to, and there were four teams involved with it. There was a, uh, the hospitality team, there's a production team, which produces all of our um, videos and audios and things like that. There was an um, events team, which organised the actual event and all the people getting it all ready, and there was also an um, arts team that actually delivered the material, and all of those teams were involved in the particular event. Since then, we've given a number of dif different ones of those events in different locations. So that's been fun. And you wouldn't have seen them on the net or anything because we're not allowed to really put them on the net. They're private events. And, and we often have uh, music that we you know, do f covers of or whatever. And if we put them on the net, we'd then have to pay all these royalties and we'd get into trouble with co copyright and all those kind of things. So, so in the end, we just have the private event or, or the event for the, as a gift to the public. We pay the royalties for the event, but we don't pay the royalties to put it on the net. And that's why you've not seen many of these events on the net. Does that make sense? Some of you might have seen some photos of them or something like that. But Now, we also have a group of teams, teams of people, who voluntarily share in the creation and delivery of the projects. And the teams, the purpose of their development is for the purpose of their own development and gifting their time, energy and resources to others. So in other words, anybody who comes to be a member of the team has to also have the same desire to give a gift of their time, their energy to others. And not a demand that somebody goes and receives it. Uh -huh. In addition, the teams of volunteers, we call them learning teams. 
And any individual who wishes to support the ideals, which were the first things we listed, those four primary ideals, is invited to share in the learning team. As long as they're willing to share as giving a gift and not having any expectations. So as soon as we notice any emotional expectations, as soon as we notice any physical expectations, demands, then we start addressing those particular problems in the team. And if the different members of the team don't want to address those problems, we ask them to leave and come back when they're ready to address it. We don't actually take responsibility for them dealing with their problems. All we do is we say, you can't come here unless you're willing to deal with your problems. We don't tell them what their problems are either, by the way. We just say to them, here's the... When I say we don't tell them, we say we have an interaction and then during the interaction the problem is exposed. Then we say, you've got this problem, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> we don't take any responsibility for them doing anything about it and if they refuse to do anything about it, we just say you can't come to the team again until you've dealt with this particular problem. So it's a very sort of hands-off approach of helping even the members of the teams. Now, all our initiatives of the Learning Centre will be created for the purpose of giving gifts to the earth, to the environment, and to people in the community without profit. So that's, the, that's our purpose, to just be an organisation that gives gifts. And during that time, what will happen is if we deal with our own emotions about money and funds and resources and all those kind of things, we'll receive enough gifts to be able to give gifts. <laughs> Does that make sense? And that's what we've been doing in Australia now for some time. So we've had the first teams, the first pro the centres have been set up now for a few years and the teams, like I said, there's at the moment about 14 or 15 different teams in Australia, three in one location and about 13 in another location. Is there any questions about that so far? Let's come down here. Um, I'm added to the email list of, for the arts team. And what I want to ask is, um, like you mentioned, for the auditions that you gave emotional feedback, mm -hmm. would there be a way or will you produce a manner in which people who are not at those learning centers but want to know, like uh, just to find out for our own growth, I guess? The problem we have with doing so, Marina, yeah. is that if we give uh, a person a copy of that, mm -hmm. then, then firstly it encourages them not to be involved in a face-to-face -face way in the teams. Now, you need to listen to my whole thing before you complain. I'm not, I'm not complaining. <laughs> no, there's a feeling coming from you. <laughs> complain. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> you remember, it's not what you're saying to me that I feel. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah. but uh, sec secondly, you need to bear in mind that there are copyright laws in the world. And, and so when a person gets up to sing a song, we can't record that song and then play it to another group of people. Now, if we give you a complete recording of everything that happened, including the song itself then there's a danger of you not understanding that and then sharing it with others and all of a sudden all of these copyright laws are broken and so we have this issue with copyright that we've got to resolve. So at the moment what we've been doing is, is creating the videos or creating the videos but we actually store them on our systems and we haven't given them out. And, and, and we're not sure how we can resolve this particular problem without spending huge amounts of money. Because in a normal concert, for example, there were like 50 different uh, performers, 50 different songs, and they eventually they're going to be performed to uh, hundreds of people in an audience. And, and at some point, you're going to have to pay for copyright of those particular songs if they're cover songs. And, 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 and if you then produce it for a, for a video, and then that video, somebody comes along and says, oh, I'd like to see that video on the net, and puts it on the net. Now we're getting into trouble for, for somebody else's inadvised action. So we still haven't really resolved what we're going to do about those particular things. However, if there are no copyright issues with what's happening in a particular team, then we, of course, always share the material. Well, that's not technically true. Is my it is now. Theory. Yeah. But there's th we are not going to be um, creating lots of um, videos of team meetings. Like, we won't be recording. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Sorry. 
That's all right. Yep, was it? We won't be recording everything that happens in a team meeting or a team because the focus is actually on being there and giving. Being the there gift. and doing it, yeah. It's not like a seminar. So we're not going to actually be generating heaps of clips for YouTube that people can interact with teams long distance um, because it's not really the focus of the team. So the other problem we're finding is that to produce every video takes a lot of somebody's effort. And the team leaders are focused on helping their particular team and, and rather than trying to produce videos and send them around the world and all those kind of things. Also, what we're finding is there's a lot of demand upon us to give you, who are not present, videos. And, and this demand is not very loving, actually, because, because the videos are a gift to you. They're not something you can demand. Do, do you understand? And, and there are a lot of people who are involved with their time and effort for free, giving them, and yet many times their time and effort is not valued by the people who are receiving them. So, so, and, the, and unfortunately, the more teams we have, like when you have 16 teams meeting once a week, that's 16 times something's recorded. That's like, and two hours are usually a meeting at a time or they're doing something uh, longer than that sometimes. That's potentially 32 hours of videos every single week that somebody has to then edit and produce and then put on the net. And, and of course, when you start analysing all that time, you finish up spending more time doing all that than you do engaging the team. And so what we're doing is we'd rather see you in a location develop your own teams. Does that make sense? And benefit from the interaction of your own teams rather than sort of vicariously live through somebody else's teams, if that makes sense. So there are quite a number of reasons why we're resisting recording the particular teams. Although if the material is important, we do generally record all of our material. And if the material is important then we do get somebody to try to produce it if we can. But that won't, will not always be the case. In addition, you've got to remember that each of the team leaders and each of the learning centre, all the learning centre managers and the team leaders are all volunteers. So you can't demand things from them. They're volunteering their time just like any member is. And, and this is something that we've found in Australia. That some of the team members became very demanding with their team leaders, expecting their team leaders to do things for them, not remembering that the team leaders were giving them a gift. And how then could they expect it? So we had to work through issues like that in the teams, and we're still working through issues like that, which we'll find every location will be the same, because everyone comes with all these expectations, which, remember, are from our discussion earlier, are all demands to meet our addictions. And of course, because it's out of harmony with love, they have to be addressed. So it's just a wonderful way of, in practice, confronting people with things. So what are the, one of the things we also have been focused on with all of the teams is we're trying to cre create teams that are in specific areas of interest that are fairly uh, all-encompassing. And this way, you have teams of people who are interested in science, teams of people who are interested in maths, teams of people who are interested in the arts, the environment, and all these other kinds of teams get established. And the beauty of doing that is that you get to a whole heap of new knowledge based on the soul with those particular teams. In addition, we're trying to have um, and develop mediums who can assist each team. But uh, that, at this stage, has been quite difficult because many of the mediums get into their addictions and then we've got to address en masse the addictions of the mediums. So... It's a sort of a, learn it's a growing process for many of the people involved in the teams, and this is what we wanted. We wanted this practical way of confronting emotions and confronting the truth in practical environments and situations, which is the whole purpose of the Learning Centre. So the benefits of the Learning Centres, as Mary's written on the board now, are we hope that it will develop a respectful, loving, self-sustaining society living in integrity. A worldwide society and these centers will be like a center of that where they will demonstrate to the world how you can live in harmony self-sustaining harmony secondly development of loving truthful humble physically and emotionally healthy individuals who support and enjoy the society so what we're hoping is the teams and the projects that the learning center runs will be confronting, confronting, confronting the people until they become more humble, more truthful, more honest and more loving. 
and uh, and what we've found in Australia is we've had some fairly big confrontations sometimes with people because they're way out of harmony with love many times when they're first attracted to the teams. And we have had to uh, permanently ban some people from the teams until they change and uh, because uh, they were just so unloving. We, you know, we had examples where one person caused the team to be in total turmoil for eight hours and wasting 12 people's time for eight hours, you know? And, and we had to address that and just say to the person, that that's enough now, right? We also had to address the team leader as to why he let it go on for eight hours instead of letting it go on for 10 minutes and what was going on there for him, you know? So we have to address and, and we try to mentor the team leaders in the process. We also hope that it will develop a balanced ecosystem in the actual learning centre itself. So in the learning centre we hope that there will be a balanced ecosystem in which all organisms live in harmony and support positively the earth and its long-term long sustainability. So in other words, the we want in the end a learning centre to do things like this. To, to uh, produce its own food, to, to look after its own waste, to create a centre of uh, knowledge of all sorts of uh, animals, birds, trees, plants, uh, all the flora and fauna that are in the system. We want a complete knowledge of all the fauna and how the soul affects it. We want to have a complete knowledge in the system of how our soul affects different diseases. And, and what kind of diseases are affected by different emotions we have in the soul. We want a complete system of information of all of these things that can be proven scientifically. So we're not interested in information that's just like fairy land. We're interested in information that's specific scientific <laughs> presentation of information right, regarding the relationship between the soul and the effects that, of what the soul creates. And so we see the Learning Centre as being um, a system that not only demonstrates and develops that, but also stores information about that to share with other people as well. The development of systems which are scientifically proven to physically and emotionally heal individuals and all elements of society and work in harmony with and create a balanced physical environment. So we've actually got now... Um, We've got some scientists uh, who are a part of our, our, our uh, learning centres in Australia. And those scientists develop some programs that we can do things and measure things uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is able to prove to other people that there is a relationship between a group of people who are addressing a particular emotion and the effect that it has on the environment. Does that make sense? And, and we're trying to do this in a scientific manner, like in a manner where we have a have a brief and then a summary and then collect data and then present that data and amalgamate that data. So we're not interested in presenting um, manipulated facts. We want to present the actual facts of what actually occurred. And we feel that we should create a cohesion within the community by encouraging loving relationships and cooperations between, between people without prejudice to age, ethnicity, education, experience, spiritual belief, political persuasions and so forth. In other words, we want any person in the community to feel attracted to being involved without limitation. Right? And we feel that if that happens, then there'll be a feeling of uh, a cohesion in the community. And what we're finding in our community at the moment, uh, where we live, the learning centre in, in Queensland is two kilometres away from where myself and Mary live. And what we find in that area is that now lots and lots of people in the community are very interested in what's happening. And many of them have been asked to supply goods and so forth. And, and some of those goods, of course, we pay for, so they feel quite good about that. And, uh, we, you know, so, so we're actually supporting the economy of the local community in this way. And as a result of that, the local community's economy has, has actually grown significantly since we've been there. In fact, we had a recent uh, Australia-wide television show saying that um, where we live is the only area in Australia at the moment that's got a, that's got a, 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 um, a growing nice. demand for property. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
So we've created a little property boom in this location. And, uh, um, and now that, that, that is having effect on the community, of course. Uh, so the community is very interested in what's going on. You get a lot of questions. And because we're sharing resources with the community that we're developing through volunteer effort, the community, of course, is benefiting. So we have little programs happening in the community where, where the hospitality team, for example, is providing f meals to n newly uh, new mothers who have just had their child, for example, and things like that. So you've got these little uh, community um, things going on, new initiatives in the community that haven't been there before. And, of course, the community benefits from these and then they hear about these particular things and then want to know more. We're not interested in preaching to them. We just want to give them love and let their desire find out what happened. Does that make sense? So that is the underlying principle of what's involved in a learning centre. Does that make sense? So what do you think about it? Yeah, it's a good idea? Yeah. Now, there is a, a, um, a document on the God's Way of Love site which is called the Constitution, and my recommendation is for people to read that Constitution. However, that Constitution, while it guides the centres, the centres are not bound to it. The reason why they're not bound to it is because the centres are owned by individual owners over whom we have no control. So, so just because that's the Constitution of our organisation... It doesn't mean that the centres have to agree with any or all parts of that, of that constitution. However, if the centre struggles with parts of the constitution, then myself and Mary, who provide um, support and ongoing uh, counsel to the, to the centres, we will obviously look at our, how we're using the resource of our time. We want to use the resource of our time helping people who have a pure desire to bring their lives and the environment into harmony with love. So if we find that a centre managers no longer have that same desire, then we just won't visit them. Does that make sense? There's no strings attached in the arrangement between ourselves and the centres. It also means, and this is something to bear in mind, that just because something happens in the centres... It doesn't mean that Mary and I have control over what happened, because we do not. The person, who, people who have control over what happens in the centres are the owners of the centres. We can only advise them. That's all we do. And this is something that uh, people have sometimes found confronting, because while we might advise one thing, sometimes the centre owners choose to do another. But we remind the centre owners that while they choose to do something that's out of harmony with love, they are not really living in accord with the guidelines for the centre and so therefore we cannot engage them. Secondly, we also publicly will state when we feel the centre owners are not working in harmony with love. Because we feel it's a, the right of other people who are not the owners of the centre to know what we feel about that particular centre. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we feel that there's a chance that some, you know, some emails come out or whatever comes out and you know, things are sent around that, that almost make everybody feel like they're representative of what myself and Mary feel when they are not. And we, we need to address that issue if that happens. Now at this point in time we've not had to address that issue with all the four centres. And I feel one of the main reasons why is because the, uh, the current owners of each centre have really strong, sincere desires to do things in harmony with the principles they've been learning of divine truth. And we are very interested ourselves in interacting with people who we feel are in harmony with those principles. Yeah. So is there any question about the centres? that you would like to have, Frank? You had mentioned earlier that you prefer the owners or directors of a learning centre to be a couple. Yes. To what extent, that couple? <laughs> <laughs> to what extent are you a couple? Uh, you mean are they married or <laughs> whatever? Uh, yeah, like in a relationship or is it just like, could it be two friends? It can be two friends, yeah. 
Um, we feel that um, there needs to be a balance of um, in the centre, and and if obviously if we're just dealing with one person, then then that's then that's not bad. But the problem often is that the inter intergender emotional injuries that people have, and if there is not a person who's in a relationship, then it's rare that they'd actually be dealing with these intergender emotional injuries. Because so they're so much in denial of them, they're not even in a relationship. Does that, that make sense? sense? So a person who's not in a relationship is already in high denial of their intergender emotional injuries. Now, if this, is, this centre is for both males and females, can you see that if a person's in high denial of their intergender emotional injuries, um, you know, it's going to be quite... It's quite going to be quite difficult to have a, a truly beneficial centre while that's the case. So we prefer to see somebody who's actually in a relationship uh, or working towards the, a relationship at least as being the leaders of the centre because we feel quite strongly that if there's just m one male or one female then they'll impose their own addictions upon the entire centre. And unless they are willing to engage that process with us and work their way through it, then it's highly unlikely the centre will benefit from that one person being its leader. Yeah. So we prefer to see two. And in all of our centres so far um, that have been established, there's either a couple or two couples who are the leaders of the centre. Yeah. We like to see a backup couple because it means that the first couple can have a rest whenever they... <laughs> like and, and can move around a bit and then go on holidays and things like that and things can still happen at the centre. Yep. Yep. Of course, anybody can buy a land and, and, integrate, in, and interact with us about what's the right way to bring it into harmony with love, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can we have the... John, thank you. Why do you want to be uh, away from cities? Um, there's a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, we feel that cities themselves at the moment have not been constructed in harmony with love. And if we just go to a city and be a part inside of a city, then all we're doing uh, to a large degree is creating you know, something that's a part of the city itself, already out of harmony with love before we begin. Secondly... Um, we feel quite strongly that during earth change events, cities are going to be some of the most difficult places to live. And, and often, because the cities have the largest amounts of addictions, generally, um, a, a, and en masse, what will happen is the city itself will impose its addictions upon the centre, and there's a high likelihood the centre won't survive during those kind of changes. Uh, thirdly, uh, oftentimes the land near the cities are the most damaged land, and therefore the most difficult to, to work with. Fourthly, um, a lot of times near the cities, um, there is a high expectation of people, high addiction expectation of people that, that we meet their demands rather than have to be engaged in a voluntary effort in some manner. So we've, we've found generally that, uh, that and, and we prefer uh, not being in a city on a, for a lot of different environmental reasons as well in the sense that we would like to see people connect with the land. And we find in the cities that the majority of people are not connected with the land. And this is one major problem. When you're not connected with the land, you then use the land or abuse the land much more readily than if you're fully connected with the land and you see the personal effect it's having on the animals, the birds and the other creatures around you. Every decision has, a, has an effect. And if you can see the effect instantly then, um, then you, you can measure its effect and do something about those effects. In addition, uh, we feel that many of the cities are going to be difficult places to live in the short term. So, so what we're trying to do is establish learning centres in country areas that are near enough to build up areas where people can travel within a few hours to them, but where in the long run, if there are no ways of mechanism, that it would take four or five days walk at least to get there. And the reason why we feel that's important is because we want to make sure that the centres themselves have some long-term survivability. So, so if we set up a centre now and earth changes do occur, 
we would like to see these centres exist after Earth Changes. It's, we feel it's no good putting in all of this effort in a location only to have that particular location either under an extreme... Um, um, what would you call it? An anarchy, in extreme anarchy or under extreme stress environmentally. So we want to see these centres have some long-term viability. So we're interested in their long-term... Like, we feel these centres... We would like to see them go for the next 100 years at least. Um, so, you know, and demonstrate the principles of love all the way through their change. And for, to actually document the change. And we feel in the cities, there's going to have to be major changes in cities before you could actually centre, set up a centre in the middle of the city and it actually survive. Yeah. So there's quite a number of reasons, yeah. Yes? I, maybe you said you were going to talk about this. I can't remember, but something around, um, would you be willing to talk about, you know, what would be safe locations or what... Yes, I can do that in a minute. Okay. But if we can just ask, answer, ask, answer any general questions first about you know what is involved in the centre or the projects or the teams, and then if we've satisfied a lot of your initial, uh, you know, in inquisitiveness about that information, then I'd be happy to proceed into areas that I feel will be relatively safe in the northern in the, in in nor North America. Could I um, just ask who yeah. feels a sincere interest in? Be honest. Who thinks it seems interesting and yeah, 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 a and interesting? But who thinks it all seems like a lot of hard? Who work? would like to be personally involved, <laughs> yeah. even if it meant moving to another location? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> the half hand up. <laughs> so it, 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 what you will find actually is if yeah. you do as a group of people engage the potential of a centre in a location, um, that, that people will come to that location. That's what we found in each centre. In the first centre we set up, it only took about a year before people started moving. And then now we have, like I said, about 40 different families that have moved into the immediate vicinity within a five kilometre radius of the centre. Right. Um, in the second one... Um, we had about uh, 15 families move within about 18 months uh, of starting to establish the centre and, um, and they've moved within about a 20 kilometre radius of the centre. It very much res resembles your soul's progress anyway. The more sincere the desire becomes, the stronger the attraction of, you know, people with a like desire becomes and, and also the more you engage the process there are rewards along the way, even if things start out slowly. You're still gaining a lot and growing a lot in those those learning centre managers are mm. confronting a lot all of the time, but as a consequence, they're growing quite a lot. Yeah. A big issue you have here, though, is that many of you don't feel like you have the personal funds to, to do a centre, and so you, you then feel very pushy about somebody who you believe does have the funds to do it for you, <laughs> and this is a very unloving thing to do. Because you've, you've got to first start addressing the underlying reasons why you don't have the funds if you really badly wanted to do it yourself. Does that make sense? Now, any centre can, can start with any size land, really. But, but we do uh, recommend, generally, it being anywhere from around 600 to 1,000 acres in size. The reason why is because it allows us to, to save a lot of that land and turn it into some kind of eco park uh, of some kind that we can illustrate the benefits of the soul changing with the animals, the birds and the other creatures in the location. Secondly, we can illustrate a lot of other techniques about land management, water management and all of those kind of things that we can put into harmony with love. And thirdly, um, it then means that we can focus on how we can bring the damaged part of the land into harmony with love. And in fact... We are not afraid of picking land that's completely damaged. In other words, not a single blade of grass or a single tree on it. No, we're perfectly happy to engage a piece of land like that. And so for many of you, when you think about the country, you think about trees and plants and so forth, whereas we're willing to engage a desert and, and bring it into harmony with love. <laughs> Marina perked up because she was like, cheaper real estate, I can do this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the fact <laughs> is that in some of the desert places you can buy, you know, yeah. for $5,000 100 acres, you know, like, yeah. 
And so, you know, a group of you could get together and buy a thousand acres for, for ten thousand dollars <laughs> in some places. So Do you want it? Yeah, if we have the microphone oh, right. here. So, yeah. I just wanted to say that recently I came across a video called the Greening Greening the Desert. Yep. That there is a yep. way to Yeah, we've dig seen we, we know all of that material. And so. it was really, really great. Actually started with my chiropractor's like, you don't have to worry about it. You know, like if you do it, God'll just do the rest. So yeah. You, you as long as you do it right. And we we've got all these techniques that we can educate the center managers about how to do it right. We've already done it right on a lot of our centers already. And um and and you know, we know how to store water on the centres and how to do a lot of different things on the centres. Things that we haven't shared with you yet because we're just so involved in doing it that we haven't had the time to collect all the data and then present it to people. So, so all of these things are already happening in centres in Australia. It's, it's, it's potentially possible to get a place in the middle of a desert and turn it into a beautiful place through your soul changing and the work that you do. Yeah, and in some ways we think that's just a beautiful way to demonstrate the power of mm. it all. Yeah. So, so to be frank, money is not that much of an issue. Although Frank is frank, and so I better <laughs> stay away from that saying. Yeah, I'm not Frank. Uh, I'm AJ. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so the important thing to remember is that is that we have a lot of opportunities, but we have to be willing to make changes in our lives for these opportunities to become available to us. And and this is what we've found in Australia is that. Um, initially, there were a lot of people with competing ideas and ideals. And what we've had to do is uh, work with them in getting their ideals to come into harmony with love. And as they did that, then there was more cooperation. It was interesting with the first centre in Australia, with the first four groups of people who bought it, they all started doing their own thing on the centre uh, and they didn't ask for any advice at all. So during that time, I called it the... I didn't call it the God's Way of Love Learning Centre... Uh, although they did. I called it... Um, I can't remember what you call it. Sanctuary. Something like no, I didn't no. call it a sanctuary either. It was I the... I can't remember. Something about a demonstration of like what not to do sort of... Yeah, thing. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I had this summary <laughs> name and I can't remember it now about how the, the so-called learning centre was demonstrating everything that you shouldn't do. Self-reliance or something, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that went on for quite a number of years until the owners started to sort themselves out and work through their issues as to what was going on. Yeah. Um, friends, anything? What's a, a, a typical day or week like for a learning centre owner? Um, it's a good question. It's very different depending on what's going on in the centre, of course. So I, I don't think you could say there is any typical day. And that's the interesting part about being a learning centre owner or manager, is that every single day is completely different to the previous one. So what we're finding for, bo for, for both the centres that are set up now in Australia is the learning centre managers are quite confronted because every single day there's something different happening, something different going on, different attraction events happening that they've got to adjust to, different emotions that are getting triggered inside of themselves. Um, but generally it involves um, a lot of people interaction, but we also encourage the centre managers to have a fair bit of privacy as well. Because so also keep in mind they're not leading the the learning projects and learning teams. That's other people. They're only overseeing them. They're just sort of overseeing the whole thing. So initially they might be quite involved in setting up a project or a team, but over time now um, they're not. there's other people leading the teams and they're just acting as sort of mentors to the team leaders. So the primary role of the learning centre managers are to make sure that the basic four fundamental ideals are continuously practised by every team leader, every team assistant, and every team. So if you can imagine if there's 16 teams, then there's 16 meetings a week, 16 things going on you know, every week that they ha put their fingers on and, 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 and look at the aspects of love, of what's going on, whether it's loving or unloving. And they need to be you know, proactive in addressing the issues of a lack of love in, in the what's going on in the teams. So that their main role is to be supportive with the basic principles of love and the basic principles and ideals of the learning centre itself. And, and they need to also have uh, learn how to handle people through this process. 
and learn how to um, interact with people in a loving way. And that's been quite confronting at times for, for some of the managers as well. So their typical day, and, and, and yet a lot of times they have very relaxed days too, you know, where, where they're just totally alone on the centre, able to enjoy the centre itself. Remember, it's their property. They're allowed to determine what, who comes on their property and who stays away. That's, that's their call. And while we at times will say to them, well, why are you being selective with that person when this person, you know, obviously is displaying the same characteristics, why are you not also asking them to leave if you've asked them to leave? And we will address, we address those issues as we observe them. But we don't, we don't always, um, you know, when they, they may not decide to change their particular things, uh, their particular feelings, you know, with regard to a certain thing. So we are patient generally with the managers as well. They, the, the managers do get to spend quite a bit of time with us. I just want to stop there. This I'll catch you later, Caroline. Yeah, See I know you, you have to leave. Thank yeah. you for our interviews. Yeah, Safe travels, thank you. Huh? But, uh, we did some interviews with Caroline about religion and the Mormon religion in particular, and y you'll definitely want to watch them on the net. They were very good. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so with the centres, uh, the centre managers, they, they need to be quite flexible, actually, and also very patient, uh, very patient with themselves, very patient with people, and things, things uh, don't necessarily change very rapidly around them. Oftentimes, too, a lot of people come to them with huge expectations, huge expectations. Like in Sweden, that's been the case where, where you know, there's huge expectations put upon the managers and, and the managers have to deal with these expectations in a loving manner. Um, and so what that's meant is that they've been now on the property six months and nobody has come to share the project with them. So that they're doing, at the moment, they're doing that alone. Does that make sense? But we, and we actually feel that people in the community will share in the project before people who have heard Divine Truth will share in Sweden. Because there's many people in who have heard Divine Truth in Sweden who are still heavily in their addictions and therefore they don't want to move to the Arctic Circle and, <laughs> and do something in a place where they feel is you know, unsafe, too cold, too hot, too, too light, too dark, <laughs> whatever the excuse is, you know? Yeah. It's very interesting for the centre managers. We, we get to spend a lot of time with them and usually we stay with them. Um, and so we get to spend a lot of time with them and, uh, and we enjoy their company a lot because they are very dedicated people generally. Uh, very dedicated to you know, wanting divine truth and the principles of love to be delivered to the planet and wanting some kind of scientific uh, presentation of this truth as well. So all of the managers at the moment are very, all of them are very educated uh, at the moment, very scientific approach, haven't they? All of them pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, all of them have a strong dedication to the ideals of love and truth. And um, in, in, um, in all of their cases, uh, they are, have had a long history of doing other projects um, and found them to not be very successful. So, so they've all come from a lot of quite wide experience uh, with regard to, you know, having some kind of a centre. Some of them have even run communities, you know, like communes in the past and all sorts of things like that. So they've had some experience with that. Um, and the difficulties of that, you know, like, so it's been quite interesting for some of them at this point. Mm -hmm. And they are all really enjoying the process, but it is very confronting being a manager. Very confronting, and and very confronting on almost every possible level you could conceive. So, so we have a lot of admiration for them, have, being willing to bite off uh, this particular process. Um, and they also, every one, single one of them so far, has put their own money where their mouth is. You know, they, they've not waited for somebody else to come along and do it for them. They've embraced a process. They've in, engaged a lot of their resources. In some cases, they've sold precious bits of property and all sorts of things that they were attached to in order to make it happen. And, uh, and this is why we feel they deserve our strong support. Do you have any advice for like individuals to share uh, your videos or writings to other people? 
Um, yeah, I, I just feel share them as you're able. Like I, I, I uh, we, we, you'll find that myself and Mary um, are pretty laid back with pretty much <laughs> everything, in the sense that, in the sense that we wait for people to demonstrate a desire to know before we generally share things with them. The reason why we do that is we feel that people who have a desire to know who are already open to receiving. And so, so what we do it, whenever we're sharing with people ourselves is we notice somebody who has a desire to know and then we share. Um, and we're open about sharing those particular things, truths. And this is why we do everything the way we do it, for free and, and openly with, with people, because we feel that that's the best way to share truth. We do not feel that it's good to force anything upon somebody. So, so my suggestion in your own lives is notice when people have a desire to know and, and then engage that <laughs> desire. But you see, many times, many of us have a... People say, have a desire to know around us, but we're too shy to share or we're too scared to see to think what they might think of us or you know a lot of times our fears kick into place and once our fears kick in then often we don't share when we have opportunities to share so so our suggestion is just share as much as you can share you know giving somebody a dvd if you feel to give it give it you know do, if you feel like you want to have a little information session in your local community then put an advert in something that's not intrusive, you know, that's not demanding, that's not marketing, but just put an advert, you know, in a local supermarket or local paper or something, saying you're going to do a share night with a particular piece of information that you've found. You know, do those kind of things. If you do those kind of things, then people will come along, you will attract a certain group of people, and then you can show it and then have discussions. And you can say to them, look, I don't know for certain... You know, all of this, but I just found it really interesting and I wanted to share it with you. And we just feel that if everybody did that, then the principles of love and truth would rapidly go through the world, actually. Um, what's happening, I feel, at the moment is a lot of people are quite afraid. As soon as I say that I'm Jesus, everyone's afraid that it's a cult. As soon as, I, you know, as, soon as we talk about learning centres, everyone's afraid that we want control of pe other people's money or whatever, not understanding the underlying guidelines and principles. And, and so you know, we feel that there's a lot of misinformation and, and we're afraid that other people will automatically misinterpret what, what we're doing. And as a result of that, we don't give them the information, which actually means they have to come up with the information themselves or they make their own suppositions. And uh, it's far better to be open, we feel. So my suggestion to anybody who wants to share any information is just share it with whomever you feel is going to be respond, respond to it. And, uh, and I feel if you do that, you'll find that you know, things change very, very rapidly when you do that. Yeah. Mike just had his hand up. Mike? Um, you, you put out a set of DVDs last year, The Essentials of the Divine Love Path. Mm-hmm. And I've got 20 copies of the set to give away. They're the PAL format, so they won't play on all U.S. DVDs. But it'll so they're play not NTSC, they're PAL? Yep. The PAL, yeah. Yep. And I'll put them on the back table. Just They're free. Go ahead and take them. Yeah, yep. that's good. So if any of you want to give some DVDs to others or something, there's some basics there. Or, or any of the stuff that's on YouTube can be downloaded. Also, Michael is providing a service to anybody in the States. Um, perhaps if I give them your email address, Michael, you'd be right with that. What, what is it? Mm -hmm. That's right. He's going to be an angel one day, you see? <laughs> At AOL.com. And Michael's willing to... He's, he's actually got an up-to-date copy of all of the stuff that's on YouTube that he tries to keep updated. And what he's willing to do is place all of that material on a disc and send it anywhere in the States. Can I put my address for Canada? And you want, yep, so Francine's doing that for Canada as well. So what was your address? Dot .ca. That's for Canada. Canada and, uh, and are you keeping the stuff up to date yep same way yep 
Now, you'll notice recently that I've uploaded probably almost 100 um, new d uh, videos. And even in the last week or two, we've uploaded another 20 or so. And I've, I've just got another 10 to do tonight. So um, it's happening fairly rapidly now where we're getting updated material. So, so we've almost got all of our backlog done. And there's only probably, I think I, think I looked at it today, and there's only about six or eight talks that haven't been done now. So, yeah, the <coughs> last talks we gave at the US should be up They're on up the net. Yeah. Just now. Yeah, I put them up this morning, uh, last night. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. So they get loaded by people in Australia. Then what, what I do is I go in and tag them all so that you can find them in searches and so forth. And then you can download them and add them to these disks. Now, these disks that the guys will copy for you, so that, that's Mike, Michael. Mike, how do you like it, Mike? Michael. <laughs> and, and Francine. And um, they're willing to copy these disks. That you, you will need a 500 gigabyte USB 3 disk if you're going to do that. So it's fi you need 500 gigabyte. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually better if you do send a one terabyte. They're actually very similar price to the five hundred gigabytes now, so so you're probably better off sending a terabyte because it, we're we're going to be pushing the envelope of a five hundred gig disk very shortly. Um, but it needs to be USB three because to copy that amount of data, um, and USB two can take a day, and if you know, if, whereas to copy it with USB three takes four to six hours generally. So. Should we say one terabyte? Yeah. yeah. And you will get a copy of all the sound files we've ever produced, all the videos we've ever produced, a piece of software, public domain software that can play the videos on a computer, a piece of public domain software that uh, can download the videos from YouTube, uh, is all on the disk, as, long, as well as all of the PDF documents that are on the website and now we also have the entire website itself on the disk. All right, so um, so pretty much everything's there. Of course, the website's constantly changing. So you, <laughs> you know um, that that's not the entire website as it was a month ago. If you copied it a month ago, but uh, it's all possible. The reason why we're doing that is that is that we feel it's great to have, for somebody just to have a little thing they could put in their pocket go around with, they don't have disk after disk, lots of disks to deal with, and, uh, and yet they've got a whole library of divine truth that's already been presented, including all of the pageant messages, all of the, um, the a lot of very old documents, uh, and eventually Michael and an, a group of other people have been copying the actual original pageant messages, the handwritten ones that are being scanned, and eventually we hope to put that on the desks as well. So eventually it'll be... All of those, all of that material. Yep. Okay. Now, in amongst that material, there's information about God's Way of Love organization. And so um, there's a little, there's a, I think there's a concert slideshow of the concert that we did and a few other things like that. Things that somebody has been managed to, to actually do. What we ask with all the God's Way of Love material is that you do not place it on the internet unless it is already on the net and then you can place it on another source. And the reason why is because of these potential copyright issues that we face otherwise. All right. okay. okay, so the question then becomes uh, where, I suppose, doesn't it? Where, where do we have these centres? Well, our spirit friends uh, have chosen the centres for the North America uh, many years ago. We chose them actually in the late 1940s. Um, we chose all of the centres, the locations for all the centres. So the issue then becomes how to find the locations that I've chosen. Does that make sense? Now, now how to find the location that a spirit has chosen is quite simple. You follow your desire... And as you follow your desire, they will lead you to the location. Right. 
But they, you've got to passionately follow your desire. They to can't do that. lead you if you don't act. They can't <laughs> lead you if you don't act. So let's have a look at uh, the map. I'll just grab that. Ah, oh, awesome. Thank you. I suppose from the last time we were here, you got tired of me trying to draw the <laughs> states. So now somebody has uh, given me a map of the states in proportion. <laughs> so we'll just load that up and just have a bit in the corners. Good. So there's your lovely piece of land. Okay. Now, mo most of you are aware that. Uh, can I draw on this? Is that fine? You sure? Okay. Most of you are aware that there are some major faults coming all the way down through here, yes? <laughs> Aren't you? And many of you do live on this side of those faults, yes? And you love living there because it's so lovely, is it not? Yeah. And also a lot of addictions can get met in those locations. Yes? <laughs> yeah. And that area of the States is actually quite a dangerous area to, to live in in the long term, we believe. So I can't see us choosing any location in that particular area, actually. And many of you are aware that uh, up here, where are we? It's up here, isn't it? Is Yellowstone. And many of you may be aware that it's already, uh, it's, uh, 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 there's pressure underneath Yellowstone, uh, volcanic pressure under Yellowstone, causing the actual surface of the park to rise. And it's risen, I think it's eight feet in the last uh, nine years or something like that. Uh, no. Yeah. Yosemite is in California. Yeah. Yeah. This area through here is highly seismic as well, all the way through here. Of course, you have also all the volcanoes up here. Uh, yes, so, so they're all up through there as well. So this whole area here in northwestern... Um, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Sorry, I'm in your way, Michael. Um, so this area here in northwestern uh, uh, America is, is a very highly active area and as earth changes occur, um, obviously these areas are going to be quite severely affected. Now, a lot of people ask me when they occur. Well, like I, I, I'm fi I find it difficult to predict the actions of 30 billion people and their soul condition and what they'll do with their soul condition when they receive any love from God. Uh, still, so I can't predict the actual timing of any event. My feelings are at the moment that it is relatively soon in the sense of maybe some events, maybe even in the next two months. That's my feeling, but I don't know for certain. However, I don't feel inclined to support a learning centre in those locations. Right. And the locations we feel um, that have a bit more of a potential to, for long-term survivability are here. One is in this area here, which is nestled behind ranges around, uh, I think it's around uh, 100 to 150 miles from Austin and San Antonio in Texas. And there's nestled by ranges all the way around. There's ranges protecting from the Gulf. There's also ranges protecting from the north. And we feel that area will be relatively, relatively safe. Now, the problem you have here in the States, and, and I must mention this, is that your cities are hotbeds of rage. As many of you already know. Imagine what they're going to be like without any law. If this is what they're like with law, what do you think they're going to be like without law? <coughs> Sorry, I just have a bit of a... Can't hold it. <coughs> and for that reason, um, having learning centres near cities or in cities is going to be 
quite difficult in the long term or me in the very short term even we feel in terms of what would happen to people setting up the centre. We feel country areas around 100 to 150 miles from a city are the best possible areas to set up because people can still get to them now but in the future if you have to walk to them you'd have to be quite dedicated to walk that distance. We also would like to see the centres be self-sufficient. Self-sufficient with their own water systems, self-sufficient with their own energy if they need it. We don't feel in the long run that the, the centres will need energy because we'll find new forms of energy we can develop. And we also feel they need to be self-sufficient with their food production at some point. The other location we feel is... Uh, uh, and this is my feelings. I haven't, by the way, I have not been able to discuss with any spirits at this point anything about the states because all of the mediums that I try to use to have the discussions with the spirits are all very shut down about providing specific information about these particular things. So all I'm telling you is my specific feelings at this point. The other area that I feel is relatively safe is this area through here. which is on the western side of the Appalachian Mountains. Yes. And you don't want to go too far south, but you want to be fairly south in that particular area, I feel. The reason why is if Yellowstone does erupt, which I believe it will, there is a very high likelihood of a very large area of the states being covered with ash because it's a super, super volcano. And the last time Yellowstone erupted, they found six feet of ash in this region here, way right over, over, what, 2,000 kilometres, uh, 1,500 miles or 1,600 miles from the site of the eruption. So, so these are the issues that you need to consider. There will, it'll be quite difficult living for a short period of time, I believe. So they are the only areas actually that I feel in the States that are sort of more satisfactory. There is the potential of any of the areas through here being quite good. But um, again, you'll have to let your spirit friends guide you to the right areas. So that's through New Mexico and edges of, of Arizona. However, you must understand that these are highly seismic areas. And uh, there, is the, the, there are super volcanoes in two, uh, very close to these areas, but um, at this stage, I do not feel that they will erupt. The last time they erupted, the whole of the states was covered in ash. Yeah. And, uh, and so if they ever erupted together, the entire of your continent would be pretty much covered in ash and be dark for a long period of time. <coughs> Do you want to ask the question on the microphone? If we can have a microphone. Um, just keep your high hand up, Robin. So, thank you. Can you um, read out the states you've got circled? And here? The Appalachians? Oh, here. Um, yeah. From uh, the north of Alabama through Tennessee, uh, in anywhere in like Virginia, North Carolina, it could all be part of that area. Just again, let your spirit friends guide you to areas, you know. But understand that anything on the eastern side of that range is highly likely it's going to uh, be involved with quite heavy flooding. Right? And anything that's near the Mississippi will also be involved in heavy flooding. In fact, there's a high likelihood of the Mississippi becoming a sea and this whole entire region through here through Montreal, Quebec, Toronto, all the way through the lakes, the Great Lakes, and all the way down to here being at sea in the future. Right. For all of that area. There's a high likelihood of that entire area being sea. What about the east coast of Alabama? Where are you now? We're, we're here. Oh, here in Pennsylvania, here. <laughs> um, yes, it's, uh, so we're here in Philly, right? Right. Yep, yep. Um, what do you think? 
<laughs> water. Yeah, you know, obviously, yeah, there'll be a lot of water-based events. Now, I'm not saying in the long term that there might not be land here still. Does that make sense? Um, but, but in the short term, there's going to be events that flood in, flood out, and so forth, take land with them and so forth. And there'll be seismic events as well that are quite extreme, far more extreme than the planet's seen for the last 14,000 years. Right. So there'll be quite extreme seismic events. And the current, uh, the current thinking of scientists is that you cannot have an earthquake greater than 10 on the Richter scale. Well, historically, in, you know, when you're talking like 14,000 years ago, there's a, there were earthquakes over 14 on the Richter scale, which you're talking 10,000 times the intensity of a 10 on the Richter scale. So potentially very, very large seismic events, unheard of, where whole parts of the uh, entire crust crack apart and crack apart for depths as, as deep as or deeper than the Grand Canyon. Right. So you're talking about quite large si uh, seismic events. Yeah. Now again, I don't know when these particular events will occur. Um, but I feel many of them will start occurring quite soon. But the key is to just follow, again, follow your desires. Now, if we're looking at Canada, um, let's look at different areas. I feel the area in here, um, in this area here, where we're we in here, is an interesting area, which is sort of um, Quebec, uh, Canada, uh, Maine, in that area there. There's a mountain range through here, and there's another range that goes through here, and in between the two ranges, I feel will be a very good spot, actually, for the first for the first uh, um, Canadian learning centres. Um, we do feel in the long run that Canada will have quite a lot of learning centres uh, there. Um, but uh, in the short, short term, we're not sure, sure how many will occur there. But that, that would be a lovely, that's a lovely location, a lovely area for, for them to occur. And that's the area I'd be focusing on. Uh, if it was me making a choice. But again, let your spirit friends guide you to locations. Right? So, so what we find is that a lot of people um, worry too much. Some of you, even me saying these things, you worry straight away, like you're straight away f afraid. You know? And the key is with all fears, they all need to be addressed at some point. And all I'm doing is saying these are where we feel the long-term survivability of a learning centre is, is probably the most, most productive place to set up a centre. We're not saying that there's other places in the States or in Canada that will not survive or, 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 or things like that. What we're saying is if, if we want to set up a centre now, there's certain places which are sort of like ideal locations ideal locations for for a center because of their nature in more than anything else because of where they are and what they do and what kind of things already exist there so the interesting thing about this region here is because it, it's still quite a treed and quite good environment area there is a large variety of living animals birds and other creatures in that area in comparison to other places in the states and so that becomes a very, very much an area of interest because, it, because if we could be involved in the support of those particular systems, those ecosystems, that would be wonderful. This area through here is very unique in that a lot of, some of it is desert, some of it, uh, uh, so therefore it makes it a very, very unique place. And it would be lovely to have a, a site that is desert or almost desert to work with because we feel that those particular sites you can actually do tremendous amounts of things to in a very short period of time and change the entire way the site looks uh, as well. And the beauty of doing it with those kind of... And so we're looking forward to getting a desert site in Australia actually as well for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, we feel that desert sites have so much potential um, because it's all about the water and how we manage the water, right? And once we understand that, and we understand how to do that, then things can change markedly with very, very little effort, actually. Yeah. 
Okay, so is there any questions about that? They're just the areas we recommend. Michael? Do you have any feelings about... If we use Mike. Yeah. Any feelings about Hawaii or Alaska? Um, obviously, Hawaii, yes, I've got feelings about it. it it's just not going to resist, <laughs> to be frank. Um, the, reason, the reason why is because uh, it's in a very highly seismic area. It's where the crust of the Earth comes apart, and it's always volcanic, and it's going to get worse. Uh, when the Pacific Plate moves... Uh, as the Pacific Plate moves, there's going to be some major movement in, in Hawaii, obviously. And, and I, I cannot see anybody who's currently living in Hawaii and who stays there surviving the events. Oh, my God. Yeah. At all. Uh, and, and to be frank, I can't see anybody who's living in, like, LA, San Diego, San Francisco, and all of those locations surviving the events either. Anybody. Like, because uh, the events just be so large. Um, much larger than what anybody currently is able to conceive. Yep. And, uh, and so I feel, again, if you just follow your desires and passions, though, and not your addictions, you'll be led to the right locations. Generally, that's, that's what happens. That's how God designed it, <laughs> if, you, if you connect to your soul. and There are obviously that. places in Mexico that would be fine. Um, so all the way through, uh, you, you've got this range that goes through Mexico, yes? And on this side of the range, f further enough distance from the Gulf in this area, in these regions here, all through here, be fine areas again to 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 set up uh, any anything, any location. And there's certain advantages in doing it in Mexico. We feel that we'll be in the long term a lot of people in Mexico interested in the divine truth. So it'd be a very interesting place to set up a centre. Um, a little point of the Caribbean. Puerto Rico. Yep. <laughs> what happened there? And Puerto Rico is a volcanic island. Yep. And it, and it will not survive Earth changes, I don't believe. Yep. Um, the only island in the Caribbean I feel that may survive Earth changes is probably Barbados, and it's only because it's not volcanic. Yep. yep. If we go there, if we go just around, because there's quite a few questions about location. Now, can you feel your ki fear kicking in? Can you just feel that? If you just okay. go behind. Straight up, yeah. Yep. 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 Just yep. straight behind. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, can you feel your ki fear kicking in? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Yeah. Why? Fear of safety. Okay. Yeah. Can you feel that fear that you said you didn't have? <laughs> that wasn't creating wars? You remember that fear that I talked about? <laughs> this is the fear, yeah. Go on. How do you feel about South Mexico? And the more south in Mexico you go, I feel South Mexico will be fine in different areas. Um, I haven't given a good, a good look over in terms of a map or anything. I feel as you proceed down into Central America, though, things will become very dicey in that region because that's all part of the Pacific Plate that is going to move. And uh, anything connected to that plate is, is just going to move quite violently. Dicey? What do you mean? Dicey. Ah, sorry. Australian quote, uh, yeah, um, means, uh, yeah, I, it probably would not survive if you were going to live there in Central America. Risky. Risky. In South, Amer in South uh, Mexico, there are certain locations that should be fine to live, but again, you'd have to, you'd have to go by feelings and, uh, and be led to the right locations. You don't want it to be close to the Gulf, and you don't want it to be close to the Pacific. So <laughs> you want, because you've got water, potentially water coming from both directions. How much close? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in, in the other day, uh, I had a, a spirit uh, telling me uh, there was going to disappear Yucatan, but I don't know if, if the spirit wanted just to. Uh, Frighten Make you? me, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, frighten me or, or it yeah. was a transformation. Um, I feel the further south you go in Mexico, the higher likelihood it is of um, there being a lack of survivability, um, mostly because of you've got the plate moving up the side, so that's going to move quite violently, and then you've got potential water-based events coming in from both coasts. And so um, the further south you go, the narrower Mexico becomes. And uh, isn't that, that's my understanding anyway. Um, uh, Yucatan, Peninsula, Yucatan. Um, that's right down the bottom, isn't it? Yeah. Where Cancun is? Uh, is is uh, where is it Cancun? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I don't feel Cancun will survive. No? No. Well, it's on the coast and, and, and also uh, on the coast of the Gulf. Um, well, Yucatan is between uh, Cancun and Gulf of Mexico. Right, yeah. So I, I, I doubt whether it would survive. But I have to have a look at the map because I haven't had a good look at Mexico. Oh, okay. yeah, no Thank one's you. asked me a question about it before. Well, yeah. Thank you anyway. Again. So after the earth changes, whenever that will be, <laughs> yeah. how is it going? So there'll be centers um, and you'll be in Australia. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so how's that going to work with uh, as far as how long do you see it? Well, well, all of you are going to embrace your relationship with God, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. And then develop <laughs> this relationship with God until you become at one with God. Yes. And you don't need Jesus and Mary to run a learning centre. Okay. So, so the reality is this is why we don't want to own them. We, you know, we want, we want people to be involved in them themselves. We do feel we'll be able to uh, teleport ourselves to different locations on earth. But, uh, but you know, when, when we're able to do that, well, that will depend on our own condition and, okay. and when we remember how to do that. So, All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. You have clothes waiting, just in case we need them. <laughs> so I'll give you my sizes. And you, yeah. <laughs> Ironically, because we visit a lot of the centres already, we've finished up, well, oftentimes by accident, leaving clothes there anyway, so <laughs> there's usually clothes there anyway. Right. Well, I, I live in San Diego, mm -hmm. and I, I think I actually have more fear around public speaking than I do about... Dying, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, earth changes and things. Yep. And... Maybe I'm thinking now, maybe I'm in denial in some way. But if so, because you're saying things that I've heard for decades, mm -hmm. people have been prophesying, mm -hmm. you know, all these earth changes, mm -hmm. and I haven't seen them come to pass. Mm -hmm. So how would I have my own personal uh, awareness and recognition of, you know, what was actually transpiring yep. in the earth? Very good question. So what's the answer? <laughs> Talk to God, I guess. Well, well, first start, you've got to ask yourself, well, we've been hearing these things for years, right? So we've got to answer the question as why we've been hearing them for years. So there's obviously spirits involved in why we've been hearing them for years. So there's obviously something spirits can see that we can't see. Does that make sense? So we need to address that issue, firstly. Secondly... Many of us do have this complacency about our life that we just generally have about our life, right? And we believe nothing bad can happen to us as a result of this complacency. And in fact, in reality, it does cover some very deep fears. For many of us, we have huge fears about something bad happening in our life that we don't want to recognise. And so what we try to do is never think about them. And by never thinking about them, we go into denial completely about their potential. It's far better to think about it happening and go, how do I feel about that? And then you'll see whether you have any fear or not. So if I told you there was going to be, and, and I know for certain, let's say I said this, and please don't say that I'm saying this for certain, <laughs> but let's say I, I said to you, I know for certain that there is going to be a thousand foot wave hit San Diego. How would you feel about that? Would you still be feeling like complacent? Or would you still be, or, or, or what would you do with that? I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I go into a state of shock initially. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that I can even go to the to the terror immediately. I think it's so it's so submerged in me to begin with. Yeah, you know? and this is the problem we face. The reason why our spirit friends cannot e educate us rapidly about particular events and situations is because we are so resistive because as soon as we hear it, we're shocked and we can't even process anything further than that. And this is one of the primary problems we face. Is that, and this is the problem I face when I'm discussing these problems with mediums because as soon as I start discussing with a medium the potential events, the potential events become so big in the medium's mind that the medium starts shutting down and then we can't, I can't discuss the event. With the, with the spirits who, who are trying to give the information. And so this is a problem I'm having with uh, addressing the issues with different mediums. 
different medium, every medium that I've had, yeah, and including Mary at this point, um, that, that I begin discussing sp with spirits through this issue of earth changes, the medium goes into some level of fear and, and shock about the potential, and then all of a sudden there's no discussion anymore that's, that's realistic or honest that, that I can, and I can see there's errors in the discussion and so I can't continue. So all I've got to do myself is to trust my own sensations and feelings about it. Does that make sense? And where God's leading me. And God does lead me to locations that, uh, that I feel very attracted to. And I'm going, ah, oh, it's interesting. Why is God leading me to this location over and over again? Yeah? And, and I know and have enough trust in God that these particular locations, whether they're going to be affected by earth changes or not, are still going to be the best locations to have a centre initially that we can establish the principles of divine truth on. And so, and so from my focus isn't so much the earth changes themselves, but rather the where in the long term will we be able to establish learning centres and still see them operational in a hundred years' time. So, you know, that's what I'm looking at. And that's what I'm... Well, when I point out these locations, these I feel are the locations where you, the, there's the potential of that occurring. I do not feel there's a potential of that occurring here at all. So while you may enjoy your lifestyle and so forth in San Diego, um, I do not see it being, at this point in time, neither a safe place to be or a place where I would want to engage a learning centre um, because of a lot of different reasons. Yeah. If you look at uh, um, the different things that happen in, a, in Australia, which is very interesting, because what, what's happened in Australia is that there's been a lot of people uh, interested in the divine truth. But um, myself and Mary, uh, I, am, I chose a location where I wanted to live. It happens to be about 300 kilometres inland from the coast. And uh, it's lovely in the Australian bush. Uh, it's very quiet, peaceful. The girls who came to stay, you can look up the night and see... The stars, like a you know, it's like a velvet cushion with all these lights on it, and it's just a beautiful location to live, and and we really love connecting with the with the environment there as well. It's a great place to learn a lot of things, and connecting with the land in that way is a great place to learn. And I and I knew in my heart as soon as I saw it, the people I was with said, "Ah, oh, this is crap land." Like, so it's no good. Like, why do you want to live this? It's a waste of money. Like, you know, weren't attracted to it all. And I said, like, no, this is this is what I'm looking for: damaged land that I can illustrate the principles of truth on quite easily, and it's nice and quiet and it's peaceful. It's and and I knew in my heart too that my soulmate would love it. Right? And uh, and and so I said, this is the land I want. So I bought 40 acres there, and it just happens to be now two kilometres away from where a learning centre is and another 40 other couples uh, or families who are wanting to practice the principles of divine truth. When you create a location like that, I, and I didn't think of that when I first went there. Yeah. I was just thinking of what's best for my soul, what's best for my growth, what's best for future, my future enjoyment of my life. And, and I wanted some kind of isolation because uh, in in, uh, that's a great way to deal with your emotions in a lot of ways. And Lawrence, I think in answer to your question, how do you have your own knowledge? I think it's really about this, this whole thing we spent the first half talking about today is getting out of denial and addiction so you can reach your soul. When you reach your soul, immediately you have the capacity to interact. Remember I said more authentically with other people, which includes your spirit guides and God. <laughs> so that's how you're going to have a knowledge for yourself. And that's what, that's what I keep reminding myself as well. When I get into my soul, that's when I'm going to be able to be guided much more. That's when I'm going to have more knowledge of all things. And, and I don't want any... Like, don't take it from us where you should live. Take it... Get to your soul. <laughs> feel your desires. And then, like, I feel so confident that you'll be safe. But you can't do it if you do it from fear, addiction. You, you're not in the ballpark of your soul then. And so you, you're not going to have a knowing. Yeah. Mm, thanks. Yeah, I definitely want it to be my, my soul's direction. Sure. And um, Of course. Yeah. But I, I, 
I just I really appreciate your bringing this subject up. Yeah. I, it just feels very timely now that you're no talking worries. about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sean, Sean could, could you just move the camera over for us so I can stay here with Mary? That's okay. <laughs> can I just start some on the time? Because we have to be out. We have to be out of here at seven, don't we, Kristen? Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Okay. yeah, so so if we look at this uh, situation with regard to earth change events, many of you are in complete denial of them occurring. I agree. And um, and I and I feel that yes, uh, you've been told enough that they're occurring, but you often you don't realize that you're being told by spirits and spirits can see things quite some distance in advance. Right? So a lot of the information that's been given to you over the last 20 years about earth changes occurring have been given to you by spirits who can see quite some distance into the future. And, and on Earth, we're very impatient. We sort of expect that if we're told something, then it's next week or next month or usually within the next year or whatever. And so we sort of expect if it, ha if it hasn't happened in the next year, then it was all false information, is the, is the automatic assumption. And, and I can't agree. It's not false information. It's just that we expect the timing of it to, to happen as soon as we hear of it or near, near to that time, when the reality is we've had years and years of warnings about these particular events. These events have happened cyclically, historically, and usually w within every 14 to 16,000 years. And uh, Mary did a channeling uh, some time ago, which you may have heard, I think it's only an audio file, yes. about uh, from, from Michael, who, the person who you call the Archangel Michael, and, and he has observed seven of these events in his lifetime in the spirit world. So they are regular events that occur um, that many spirits know of regularly occurring on earth. Because they happen every tens of thousands of years, everybody on earth believes they're never going to happen in their particular lifetime. And uh, I feel quite certain it's definitely going to happen in yours. Yeah. Oh, another, another question is then, if there if there are mass deaths, let's say, in California, and there are a lot of really beautiful, very spiritual people on their path doing their work in California that I'm aware of, and all around the world, of course, what happens in the spirit world? I mean, it's like a it's like an Ellis Island of the spirit world. <laughs> all the new immigrants. Firstly, Lawrence, you have a very high opinion of, of spiritual people in California <laughs> in comparison to God's opinion. Um, many of the people who believe themselves to be highly spiritually developed on the natural love path are going to find when they pass that they will pass, like many of the other people in their neighbourhood, into the hills of the spirit world and have just as much struggle as their neighbours in working their way through their p specific emotional issues. Many of them have a deep facade of, of love that doesn't hit their heart. It only, it only causes them to attempt to act in ways that are, that, are, that are loving because they feel a sense of arrogance or pride about their condition. So, so this is something to bear in mind when you analyse particular areas. There's certain areas in Australia that are very similar, actually where we have certain areas where we, when we travel there and go to that location, we can feel the level of arrogance is so great that there is a, there is a, a chance that they will, for a long time, never, never want to have a relationship with God or, or work through the issues related to being humble. And we feel that there are many places in the States like that who, that have this sense of personal arrogance about their condition when it's very, very different. And when they pass, they will find it to be very different, unfortunately. Um, so, so your opinion of uh, while these people may be outwardly demonstrating what appears to be love, oftentimes they are in heavy addiction and, and oftentimes only demonstrating love because they have a sense of arrogance a, a, about their own condition in comparison to others. And this is not a true state of love, and therefore that will be exposed at some point in the future, probably after they've passed. In answer to your question, though, uh, if there is mass uh, deaths on the planet, and there will be mass deaths on the planet in, in all sorts of areas of the planet, not just here in the States, whole communities will pass all at once. 
And because the whole community passes at once, it's almost like they've never passed because they don't experience the same losses as, as a normal death would experience. See, when you normally die, you're leaving behind a lot of people. You're leaving behind all of those relationships. But when a whole group of people die in a certain area, they're not leaving behind any relationship. So it's almost like there's been hardly any change for them. So when they pass into the spirit world, it's like they have no change in terms of what's actually occurred in their life. Now, that has advantages and disadvantages because the advantages are they don't have huge amounts of grief and suffering and pain and all these emotions to go through instantly as soon as they've passed. However, all of their addictions remain in place with all of the people who they were addicted to because they are all now in the same location as they are. So now they've still got the addictions in a, to a heavy degree not being confronted by any grief. And so while initially it will be quite beneficial for them in terms of pain, in the longer term it may not be so beneficial because they still have their particular addictions in place with each other, but they'll now be in the spirit world acting out those addictions rather than on earth. So, so from, a, from a spirit's perspective, and that's our perspective, um, we, we sort of feel that, uh, that while there are certain benefits to having whole communities pass like that, there are also certain disadvantages. And uh, we've been working for many years now, for, for over 100 years in the spirit world, we've been working to set up uh, places where, of education where these people who pass will be able to be educated about what's happened and about, about truths, you know, about the truths about the universe. So there's a big preparation that's already occurred in the spirit world that's been occurring now for many years. And we began that preparation in the 30s. In the, so in the 1930s, we began this preparation in the spirit world. And, uh, and it's been well known in the spirit world that these events will occur for a long time. And so we've spent a lot of our time in the spirit world attempting to get those particular things ready. And we feel that we're pretty prepared for a large mass of people coming from the earth. Of course, there is still 21 or 22 billion spirits earthbound. And uh, that is our focus at this point in time of trying to assist those particular people because there's a high likelihood they'll remain earthbound. But there'd be less people on earth for them to influence, which means the intensity of their influence on the individual will be greater. Does that make sense? And so we are quite concerned about those particular people who are earthbound and what we can do to assist those to free up their earthbound condition before the events occur. Yeah. And that's probably more of what we're concerned about than the actual people passing. Yeah. Passing is nowhere near as bad as what you believe. Yes, And... Uh, and particularly if it's something that happens instantly. If it happens drawn out over a long period of time, it can be quite harsh. But when it's something that happens instantly, it's just like sometimes you're not even aware until somebody tells you that, that it's actually occurred. And, uh, and that's how it will be for many people on the planet, actually, through these events. Yeah. Chris. Chris. Um. From the spirits that I've talked to, uh, what I got was that um, they said while the, in our location, while the leaves are still green, um, and it was a sense of like October, early October. Mm. Um, and so I was wondering, because that's only a few months away, do you see the learning centers in the U.S. getting started now or uh, soon after the earth changes occur? Um, I feel you have the potential to start them as soon as you can. Um, and I feel any work you do starting them now is always going to be beneficial in the long run. The learning centre starts in your heart. And that's what we've found at home. And you'll find that here. It starts in your heart as a desire. Once you start engaging that desire, then the, the desire will give birth to a creation, which will be the centre. And, and that creation can occur over the coming months before changes occur. The beauty of engaging the process is that you'll be led by your desire, not led by fear. 
So you'll be led by your desire to discover rather than going, oh, I'm afraid I've got to find somewhere in the, one of these locations, you know. No. And that, uh, that is not true either. The reality is there are many safe, potentially safe locations. And I'm just letting you know the places where I feel probably the most safe that I, that I can see at this point in time. And, and many of your spirit friends already know the locations. This is what I'm saying to you. It's a matter of you following a desire before you'll be able to find the location. And, and life will take you to certain places. You know, somebody might be getting married somewhere and you decide, oh, let's have a look around here. And somebody, you know, uh, there's all sorts of events in your life that can happen over the coming couple of months, right, that can lead you to places that you might not have been to before just by embracing a process. And then you decide, wow, this is a place that AJ sort of indicated. It'd be interesting to have a look around here and you go for a drive and, oh, there's this person you meet and there's that, you know, there's all these things that can happen once you're there. But nothing can happen if you engage nothing. That's the issue you face. And, and that's what I feel, you know, this is what I feel you need to be very careful of, is total inactivity. Uh, because if you have total inactivity, there's a high likelihood nothing will happen. And yes, you will establish it after the events occur, given uh, how many of you survive the event um, or the events. My suggestion would be, and what I would love to see is that all of you survive any event that occurs and all of you engage your passions and desires and all of you end up in a location that, that, that's relatively safe where you can in continue to engage these passions and desires and eventually share the truths you've learned. That would be wonderful. I don't think it will happen that way necessarily, but I feel that would be wonderful. Yeah. AJ, I, I, I'm in Washington State. I live in Washington State. Yep, <coughs> that's up here somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, all, yep. all the way up, up in the yep. corner near. Um, yeah. Yep. And um, I actually have, pretty near the Ramtha School there. Yep. And <coughs> this weekend I actually have some friends there in an event, yep. a dinner yep. you know, with Jay-Z and Ramtha. Yep. And some of those people have been, um, and Ramtha's been talking about Earth Changes for some time, as you know. And yes. Some of those people are working on underground um, homes, uh, yes. places to go. Yes. And uh, in regard to the denial that uh, some of us have still, you know, and that the deep resistance to what he's been saying. And yeah. So we can look at some of the other discrepancies in those teachings and say, well, that's just a spirit. Yeah. No higher than the sixth sphere, right? Yeah. Um, and in fact, it's not Ramtha anymore. <clears throat> and I got that from what you said. Yeah, I, yeah, I got so that from what you said. And actually, that aligns with some of the some of the things that people have commented about and noticed in changes. And yes, but the school is still in place. And exactly, I, under I understand all that. Yep. Um, but I wonder if you have anything to say about that in regard to the safety in that area. Actually, for those people, I mean, in other words, the question has come. Well, if you go underground and the winds come and the water, and then you know you come back out or do, do you care to comment about that at all or? well uh, like i feel that it all gets down to how, how comfortable do you want to be <laughs> um, in the end like if you want to live underground for six months or 12 months uh, then go ahead if that's what you want to do but i can't see any of us really enjoying that kind of a life and surely there's other places in the states that would have a better outcome and um surely it would be better to <laughs> be in those places and um, i feel that a lot of the times um we can be driven by, like, people are so attached emotionally to where they currently live. Myself and Mary are not attached at all to any place on earth. And I suppose part of the reason why is because we have a lot of homes in the spirit world. But, um, you know, we don't feel any attachment to a single place. So, so if you have an attachment to a single place, there obviously must be some emotions involved with that attachment. And that attachment can drive you to do very strange things, like bury a home underground when you could just move 2,000 miles somewhere else and have a home above ground that has some sunlight occasionally. <laughs> um, and I just feel like, yeah, quite often <laughs> we, we are doing some very strange things um, when the reality is that we don't need to do those particular things and we could have a much more simple life by making some different choices. Um, so I, I sort of feel like it would be better for people to make some wise choices ra about how they want to live the rest of their life rather than sort of worry about surviving something in a bunker. 
like uh, to be frank i i think if i had to build a bunker to survive i, I don't think i'd want to survive um yeah. yeah and that's the feeling uh with many of us there and so and yeah. so that you know now the um uh, the Divine Love Path has actually been exposed to some of those people in that area, and we'll see. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had some discussions with some of uh, JC's close... Uh, sorry. JZ. JZ's close aide um, a few years ago now because they, they tried to sue us about some things we'd done with <laughs> they friends. They do that. They have a way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I, I just treated it lovingly and the whole problem went away okay. and they, they finished up sending me some videos and things like that. Yeah. And so everything ended uh, amicably. And um, I just feel like there are many people there who would be very interested in knowing the truth. And I feel Ramtha, who is now a celestial spirit, mm -hmm. would love for them to know more yeah, divine would, truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I feel that he's doing a lot of work trying to actually assist many of the people there Good. understand the truth. The, the issue for him is he doesn't care whether they live or die, mm -hmm. uh, to be blunt, because they're still alive. Right. Right. And uh, all he's interested in is, is correcting any untruths that he gave to them, uh, which is something that he, he understandably is involved with, correcting untruths that were delivered. So, um, but I feel in terms of the location, if you ask me about the location, yeah, it's a very dangerous location yeah. to live uh, in terms of earth change events. Um, it's a highly seismic region. You've got Juan de Fulca Fault there. You've got the San Andreas Fault yeah. going up the side. You've got the potential of subduction zone volcanoes mm -hmm. going off and being in between Yellowstone and the coast. Yeah. And or so... Yeah. yeah, whereas Ramtha actually said otherwise to those people. Exactly. You know, so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not saying that it might not potentially survive. Right. Uh, I'm saying that if you look at all the potential events that can occur in that right. particular region, you've got to question how well you'll survive. Quality of life. The yeah. quality of yeah. life you're yeah. going to have. Yeah. And uh, I personally would like to see our learning centre set up in a place where the quality of life is relatively good, mm -hmm. where there's little impact on uh, from the environmental changes, so that these centres are sort of become a centre of providing resources mm -hmm. to the community mm -hmm. at large, right. and where they sort of can continue without missing a beat. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Whereas uh, if I set up such a thing in uh, Washington, I would not expect that they'd be able to continue without yeah. missing a beat. I think there'd be quite severe uh, changes occurring in that location. And you'd have to do things like building bunkers if you wanted to survive, and I and I really can't see the attractiveness of such a, yeah. such a choice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And if we come down, yeah, to Scott, Scott and then yeah. down, and then across. I was wondering if you could address the like the main differences between what you can do in a physical body versus a spiritual body. I mean, that, I know, like, giving birth, you can only do in a physical body. Right? Ah, yes, I see, yeah. Um, giving birth is probably one of the only things that y is different. <laughs> um, the rest is the same. And unfortunately, for many people, they'll find that they'll be more limited in their spirit body than their physical body if they haven't grown in love. The more you grow in love, the less limitations you have in the spirit world. So as you grow in love, you have less limitations. You grow more in love, you have less limitations. And so every single thing you can do in a physical body, you can do in the spirit world aside from giving birth. Uh, and you can do a lot of other things in addition. The reason why giving birth is limited to the earth is because it's the place of incarnation. It's the place where a person's individualized, their first experience. And that's the reason why God's created it to be a, a place where, where birth is possible. Um, but aside from that, um, anything can be done, including have sex and all, all, all the other things involved with our general life, in addition to much more. There's much more possible in the spirit world, but it's only possible when the condition of love allows it. Whereas on earth, you can do things here that, that are not dependent upon the condition of love that you're in, whereas in the spirit world, it's all dependent upon the condition of love you're in. So there's also you know, flora and fauna, animals? Yes, and yes. Um, animals, birds, trees. Uh, there's no insects. Um, mm. <laughs> insects are uh, uh, a beautiful, uh, unique creation on Earth uh, and in, in the physical. Um, they, they enable so many things to happen in the physical realms that, that don't need to happen in the spirit realms. 
And so most of the, the only animals or creatures that pass in the spirit world have essential nervous systems. So anything that doesn't have a central nervous system does not have a spirit body and therefore does not pass into the spirit world. It actually, when it dies here, it dies. Just as an addition to that though, um, I feel obviously everything God does, <coughs> he does with a purpose. And she creates uh, these different, this physical body for us so that we might have experiences that help us in our eternal growth to God. So while what we say about passing is not a big deal and in the spirit world you can do lots of fantastic things and have a full existence and continue to grow and all of those things that are not commonly known on the earth, um, there is a purpose and a value for this physical life that we have and that is why obviously it's loving to have a regard for this this life that we're given here in the physical because there are certain lessons and mercies and and different experiences and ways that God can teach us here that are unique to and the that earth. are not available in the spirit world yeah. yeah 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 so just as an aside to that point yeah yeah I've heard you speak once before about uh, spirit clinics. So if uh, the earthbound spirits, uh, I think it's important to aspect to consider having uh, mediums that would help them after the earth changes. Very important. This is something that we've been trying to develop. But unfortunately, many of the mediums have a bit too selfish a focus with their mediumship. But, but it's very important for mediums to have a less selfish focus with their mediumship because we can help a large variety of spirits and if we can help these spirits get out of the earthbound condition, then it automatically relieves the earth of a lot of very negative emotion and, and therefore lets you be free to experience your own experience without being constantly impacted upon by spirits who are trying to control you. So we feel this uh, role, one of the learning centre teams is the mediumship team and the reason why the mediumship team is being created is specifically to help spirits progress. And, and we feel that it's a, it's a, there's a great opportunity there and it's going to be so much fun for the people who want to do that uh, in terms of helping the, the particular spirits progress. And we also feel that it will relieve the earth of so much pressure and even relieve individually you of so much pressure to feel your own emotions because a lot of times suppression at the moment occurs because these spirits want you to maintain your addictions. And, uh, yeah, so we're, we're really... We, uh, we do a lot of work ourselves uh, trying to help groups of spirits, but we'd love to see large teams of people yeah. helping spirits. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to learn personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it'd be a, it's a very um, enjoyable and and fulfilling um, thing to do. Yeah, I was fascinated just listening online and and uh, on Friday as well. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's just wonderful being able to engage uh, people who have a strong desire to change. Or have who have a have a lot of uh, problems with changing, and then to feel them go through those changes and and uh, the relationship that gets established yeah. is also a deep friendship that continues mm -hmm. for the rest of your existence. Actually, you, you finish up passing into the spirit world, mm -hmm. and actually all of those people who you help that you can't remember the face of, and will all just come to you and say, "You were the very first person that helped me," you know, and. And there's so much uh, joy that you receive through ha having known that you did all these things without really understanding the, the, the power of what you did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel that's a wonderful process yeah. to be involved in. Yeah. yeah. And another quick question. I've never heard um, you speak about uh, the extraterrestrial involvement in all this because I, I know that's real, but I don't know how it fits in. Um, I've spoken about it um, before, but um, basically there is no extraterrestrial involvement okay. in all this. There are spirits who claim to be extraterrestrials okay. and who materialise sometimes, forms and also themselves, um, in different states. And um, these spirits are what I would feel... They're spirits who do not understand what they're even doing, to be That's frank. That's what I figured, yeah. yeah. And... Um, and they often do take people from the earth and uh, in their sleep state and, and experiment on them and do all sorts of things to them, which are all unloving. Yep. And, uh, and that, so therefore people on earth do have the experiences they describe. Yep, that, yep. 
but but they are all very unloving spirits involved in this perpetration of these untruths. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, not many people on earth are open to the the truth of what's really happening there either. Yeah, that's the first time I hear the truth. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, up the back there. And then I think we can finish off now. Everyone's pretty tired. I'm so pretty tired. You're up the yeah. back. I'm pretty tired. It's time for us to finish. E.G., no one choose where to die or how to die. For example, yesterday or two days ago in Colorado. Yeah. Can you answer? Um, yes, the reality is we all choose where to die, how to die, and when we're going to die. But it's not an intellectual choice. It's because of the choices we're making in our soul of the different and the different things that we suppress that create events around us that cause our death. So every, th every death that occurs on this planet, every single one, is caused by an amalgamation of a series of events that have led to us make, to make specific choices that have led to our own demise. And we all need to understand that. We all need to grasp that it's actually the soul condition that determines when we're going to die, how we're going to die, and what was the other one? When, how, where. and where. where. Sorry, where we're going to die. And, and unfortunately, um, we are in deep denial of our condition most of the time. And so our death finishes up taking us by surprise. But the reality is if we were in less denial, our death would never take us by surprise and we'd actually know the exact time in advance if we were going to die at all. The surprise would, would be with me, for me yeah. or for my family. It's the same for everyone on this planet. Everyone on this planet has, has, through their soul, chosen what is happening in their life and their choices determine when they die and where they die and the location of their death and all those things. It's their choice that results in that. It's a very interesting subject, probably some that we will talk about <laughs> at some future time in more yep. detail. But we need to understand that everything we create in our lives is totally determined not by what we choose to do in our mind, but rather what we've chosen in our soul and our emotional You've state. You've spoken about that somewhat in the Fate and Destiny talk, didn't you? Yes, yeah. 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 So there's, there's a talk, a talk called talk. Fate and Destiny that's on the internet. Uh, it was given, I think, in 2010 or, yeah. or, or something like that, that you can have a look at. And in there I talk about uh, why, you know, what creates our death and, and what is our fate and what is our destiny. And, and to be frank, we have complete control over our fate in every single aspect, including in the way in which we're going to die. That We have complete, complete control of that as well. Thank you. Yep. Okay, well, thank you so much, you guys, for your yes. lovely attention for the last <laughs> couple of hours uh, and a couple of days, I should say. <laughs> Yeah. And I can I yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to express uh, how how much we've enjoyed our weekend with you guys yeah. and uh, thank you for your attention and your engagement. And also that um I know we speak really frankly with you about the addictions that we see in the United States. And uh I know that can be really confronting. Please don't think that we only do it here in the United States. <laughs> we do it pretty much everywhere we go. And it's not because we want to pick on you. Uh, in fact, we love you guys. And we can see that the reason, that the best way to challenge you is to talk about these things. And many of you, if you think about it, have felt very challenged. But we can see that that's the best way to help you grow. So... Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for engaging that process with us, with Grace, because yeah. um, you have. And so particularly today and, yeah. and last night as well when we were having our chin wag around the, <laughs> around the mill, you know, I felt many of you engaged that process with me really well. So you know, th it's good that you had the courage to do that. Um, and also I wanted to thank people. A few of you expressed an interest in book group and I'm sorry that we didn't have the chance to run a book group while um, we were here. It was just too busy and we're still a bit um, 
time, trying to adjust to time zones, so it didn't happen, but yeah. thank you for that interest. Yeah. And lastly, um, I d you're probably about to do it, but just to acknowledge those people who um, helped us organise mm. here. Um, yes. And uh, if I can point out to you that they have actually paid for the venue and they have actually paid for our accommodation mm -hmm. uh, as well, so, so um, we would love to thank them for that. We've had people in Australia play for our flights to you, so we'd like to thank them for that. And we'd also like to thank you for your donations uh, that you've given to us this weekend. And just one other group of people who donate to you <laughs> and to us all the time, and that is um, specifically Lena and Igor in Australia, who um, without them, you guys would never have seen anything on YouTube, actually. Yeah. So, so we'd like to thank them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And uh, also, we'd like to thank Luli too. I feel who's on our on our um, office, office inquiries. email inquiries. You've she, probably had an interaction. You may have with had her. an interaction with her, probably. Yep. And uh, she is now looking after that full time, pretty much. And uh, as you can imagine, it's a growing job uh, because more and more people who become aware of divine truth end up sending information. And it's been wonderful. She's been doing that because the reality is, myself and Mary very rarely now get to answer our emails. I think I've got 500 emails unread in my inbox at this point in time. And, uh, and it's great having somebody there who's willing to uh, in address issues with people in a very patient manner by the written word, which is quite difficult actually and time-consuming. Mm. So we'd like to thank her for that yeah, too. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, can you can express your appreciation to those people. We have their... Um, on our website now, we have their contact details. If you if you look at, uh, I think it's the donation section, yes. donations to others, you'll find Luli is on the site and with her details, and and Lena and Igor are on the site with their details, and uh, they live, uh, they are fully uh, like volunteering all of their time now, uh, both both uh, both of those, all of those three people. And so we'd like to thank them so much for doing that. And and they are, like, while we do give them some funds um, ourselves, it's not a enough for them to live uh, that we give them. And uh, and so, you know, they do rely on the donations that come in from other people around the world. So we'd like to thank... They'd probably like to thank you for your donations yes. as well. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, and hopefully and we can great inspire you to uh, discover your souls yeah. <laughs> and to follow your passions over the coming months. Yeah, yeah. Not to delay it and not to put it off. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. 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 So thanks for your time. Thanks guys. everyone. Thank you. And thanks for your time too. Yeah. <laughs>